Salim versus James Elmer Mitchell and John Bruce Jessen in the U.S. District Court for Eastern District of Washington at Spokane, docket number 2, colon 15-CV-286-JLP. Today is Tuesday, March 7, 2017. The time is 10.10 a.m. This deposition is being taken at Blank Rome in Washington, D.C. at the request of Gibbons, B.C. I'm Jason Fifield, the videographer of Magna Legal Services, and the court reporter is Laurie Bangart of Magna Legal Services. Will counsel and all parties present please state their appearances and whom they represent? We'll start with uh, plaintiffs. Lawrence S. Lesper from Gibbons, PC, on behalf of the plaintiffs. KJ Hill is also from Gibbons, PC, on behalf of the plaintiffs. And Michelle C. the American Civil Liberties Union. Dana McGrady from Gibbons PC on behalf of the plaintiffs. Kyle from Fry from Gibbons PC on behalf of the plaintiffs. Okay. Jerry Smith on behalf of the defendants. Hank Schulke on behalf of Drs. Mitchell and Jesse. Ann Kearns on behalf of the defendants. Let me do the government. Uh, Tim Johnson with the Department of Justice on behalf of the United States. Cody Smith of the CIA on behalf of the government. Heather Walcott, CIA on behalf of the government. Megan Beckman, CIA on behalf of the government. Uh, Bob Bennett on, on behalf of the witness, Jose Rodriguez. Brooks Hanner on behalf of Mr. Rodriguez. David Unruh on behalf of Mr. Rodriguez. Okay. Will the court reporter please swear the witness? Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm start. other right hand? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give in the case shall given this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, before we begin, uh, Mr. Johnson has a statement on behalf of the government. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. As mentioned, I'm Timothy Johnson with the Department of Justice of representing the United States government in connection with this case. Um, as noted with me here today are Cody Smith and Heather Walcott, attorneys with the CIA Office of General Counsel, and Megan Beckman, a paralegal at the CIA Office of General Counsel. Although the United States government is not a party in this case, we're here today to protect <coughs> our interests of the United States that may be implicated by today's deposition of Mr. Jose Rodriguez. We understand the questions in this deposition will cover topics related to Mr. Rodriguez's career with the CIA. To what? I'm sorry, speaking too quickly. Uh, related to his career with the CIA. Given the uh, sensitive nature of Mr. Rodriguez's uh, positions and the information he required in those positions, we're here today to ensure that no classified, protected, or privileged information is disclosed. Uh, to guide the witness and parties in this deposition, the government has provided them with classification guidance from the CIA, uh, which we have marked as Government Exhibit 1 for the record. Uh, this CIA guidance was previously produced in this litigation on May 20th, 2016, and is marked as U.S. Bates numbers 22 through 24. It provides a list of categories of information about the CIA's a previous detention interrogation program that remain classified as well as a list of categories of information that are now unclassified. I'd like to now issue a continuing instruction on behalf of the government to Mr. Rodriguez that consistent with his non-disclosure agreements with the government, he not answer any question with information identified as classified in the CIA classification guidance marked as Government Exhibit 1 or that is otherwise protected or privileged um, by the government. The United States also reserves its right to object to any question posed to Mr. Rodriguez that would tend to call for the disclosure of classified, protected, or privileged government information, and to specifically instruct Mr. Rodriguez not to answer any such questions. Uh, with this, these caveats, the United States government has no objection to the deposition proceeding. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, good morning, Mr. Mar Rodriguez. As I said, my name is Larry Lusberg. I represent the plaintiffs in this matter. Um, I'll be asking you questions today. 
Um, sir, have you ever uh, been in a civil deposition before? Never have. Okay. So I'm going to just give you some basic instructions with regard to this. If you have any questions about them or anything else, please stop me. Okay. Um, you have been sworn to tell the truth, um, and that oath is just the same as if you were in a court of law. Do you understand that? I understand that. Um, so you've noticed that there's a court reporter here. Mm -hmm. um, it's important uh, so that she can get all the words down that you let me finish my questions before you answer, um, even if you absolutely know how I'm going to finish the question. Okay. And I'll let you finish your answer before I ask the next question, OK? Very good. Um, if you don't understand anything about a question I ask, uh, please feel free to ask me and I'll clarify it. Mm -hmm. um, if you answer it, we'll all assume that you uh, understood the question, okay? Okay. Um, so that was an example of your answering before I was finished with my question. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, if you need any breaks at any time, feel free to take them. Um, you can consult with your counsel, Mr. Bennett, with regard to that. Um, and um, is it clear there? OK. OK. Um, any questions then before we start? No. OK, thank you. Um, so um, Mr. Rodriguez, you recall that you um, were originally supposed to be deposed back in January? Yes. OK. Um, and that deposition was canceled because you, were, you signed a declaration. Do you remember that? Yes. OK. Can we have that? Declaration. We're going to mark this declaration as Exhibit 36, um, continuing in uh, the order that we've done. Thank you. If you could, um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, if you could take a quick look at that um, declaration and, uh, in particular, uh, if you look at page 20, I believe it is. And let me ask you, is that your signature at the bottom of yes, page? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, Again, let me just finish the questions, okay. and I understand. Um, that's how, not how human beings converse, but that's how we do this in depositions. Um, and it's dated January 24th, 2017, correct? Correct. Okay, that was the date that you signed it? Yes. And before you signed it, did you read every paragraph? Yes. And it's entirely true? True. Okay. Um, who drafted this declaration? My lawyer. Okay. Um, and what was the arrangement pursuant to which you signed it? That is, what did, what did, why did you sign it? I signed it because uh, it was the truth, uh, as I know it, uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and does it include all the information of which you're aware that pertains to these subjects? Yes. Okay. Um, the, um, was your understanding when you signed it that as a result of your signing it, you would not have to be deposed at that time? I thought that was the case. Okay. Did you get anything else in return um, as a result of signing the, the, the uh, declaration? What do you mean? Uh, was there any kind of deal that you, you would sign the declaration and get something in return? No. Okay. okay. Some very quick um, background on, uh, on you. Um, you used to work at the CIA, correct? Correct. Um, and. Um, if you could, just very briefly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, provide your, uh, when did you start at the CIA? I started at the CIA in November of 1976. Okay. And um, what was your first position there? I, uh, first, the first two years was training, and then after that I was ready to go overseas, and I went overseas uh, six or seven times. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, before you worked at the CIA, you went to law school, correct? Correct. Um, did you ever practice law? No. Okay. Um, do you still have your law license? No. Mm -hmm. um, so did you have your, license, your law license in 2002? No. When did you give up your law license? I never had, uh, got a law license. I just graduated from law school. I went to law school to get a job at the CIA, actually. Okay. 
Um, so did you study, let's say, criminal law in particular? Yes. Um, and what, just general courses in law school regarding criminal law? Correct. Okay. Um, at any point, did you study the definition of torture in, um, in Title 18 of the United States Code? At some point, perhaps, back then. Back when? Back when I was in law school, but uh, more recently uh, when I was involved in running the uh, counterterrorism center. Okay. Let's talk about that. Um, when did you begin, begin at the counterterrorism center? I began in September of 2001. So right after 9-11? About 10 days after 9-11 or so. Okay. What was your um, first uh, position at the Counterterrorism Center? I was the chief operating officer for the Counterterrorism Center. Mm -hmm. um, so if your Wikipedia page says that you were chief of staff, is that incorrect? That is incorrect. Okay. Um, your title was chief operating officer? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, it's a title I gave myself because there was no position for me there. Okay. How did, how did that happen that you gave yourself that title? I was asked to support and help uh, Kofer Black, who was the head of counterterrorism. Sorry, Kofer. Kofer Black, who -E was the head of the counterterrorism center, and uh, to go help him out. So I got there, and I had to give myself a title, find an office, and become essentially the number three person. And how long were you uh, the chief operating officer of the... Until May 2002. Okay. And I didn't get to end your question. Okay. Yeah, so we just need to both be better about that. Okay. Um, so let's start. So you became... Um, you, I'm sorry, you, you were uh, chief operating officer until May 2002, is that what you said? Yes. And, and then what position did you assume? I became the director of the counterterrorism center. What is the Counterterrorism Center? The Counterterrorism Center is the uh, organization within uh, the agency that uh, carries out covert action, uh, foreign intelligence operations, analysis on counterterrorism for the agency, for the director. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand that. So it, the, we'll call, is it okay if I call the Counterterrorism Center CTC? Yes. In fact, it, it's commonly referred to as CTC, right? Correct. Um, the, so the CTC carries out covert action, correct? Correct. Um, it does foreign intelligence operation analysis, right? Foreign intelligence operations. Okay. And you said for the director, is that right? And analysis, separate, for the director of the CIA. Okay. Um, so you reported directly to the director of the CIA? I had a reporting channel to the director of the CIA, yes, mm -hmm. in addition to other people. Mm -hmm. um, did, the, did the functions of the CTC change after 9-11? Yes. Okay. In what way, generally? Overnight, uh, we were overwhelmed with uh, requirements to go out and get al-Qaeda and protect the country and save American lives. Um, at that time, and when we say at that time, let's focus on the time period in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, did you know anything about the Air Force's survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, which we refer to as SEER program? Uh, not early on, later. Okay, when did you learn about the SEER program? When we started to uh, figure out what to do uh, to get Abu Zubaydah to tell us uh, what were the impending attacks on the country. Okay. So before um, you um, tried to figure out what to do to get Abu Zubaydah to tell us what were the pending attacks on the country, you did not know anything about the SEER program? I, didn't know it. I did not know anything. Mm -hmm. Had you heard of it? Uh, no. You uh, mentioned that you have a law degree. Um, have you had any training in psychology? Uh, no. Okay. Um, 
have you studied or know anything about post-traumatic stress disorder? No. Have you heard of that? Yes. Okay. What have you heard about it? What I hear on TV. Okay, just from TV? Yes, TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about post-traumatic stress disorder anywhere other than on TV? No. Okay. Have you studied at any point the long-term effects of torture? No. Um, have you spoken to people about the long-term effects of torture? No. Okay, um, I want to um, direct your attention to the time period in which um, doctors Mitchell and Jessen were hired. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for the record, doctors Mitchell and Jessen are here today. Um, at the time that Dr. Mitchell was hired, um, what was he doing, do you recall? He was hired by the CIA in December of 2001 uh, by the Office of Technical Services to provide uh, psychological support, uh, applied psychology and research. And he came to CTC in April of 2002 to help us out uh, with Abu Zubaydah. Okay. Um, just to break that down a little bit. Um, What was the Office of Technical Services? What is that? It's an office within the Directorate of Science and Technology that uh, does this type of th stuff. What, what type of stuff? Like hire the psychologist. OK. Um, so when Dr. Mitchell was working at the Office of Technical Services, you said he provided psychological support. What does that mean? He provided. Uh, research and applied psychological support uh, to the agency. Mm -hmm. um, so he did research? I assume so. Mm -hmm. You don't know? No. Um, do you know anything about the applied psychological research that he did? No. OK. Do you know, beyond what you said, anything more about what his activities were at OTS? No. And when I say OTS, just so that the record is clear, I'm referring to the Office of Technical Services. Um, do you know anything about uh, any psychological, applied psychological papers that he did or? No. Uh, okay. Um, how did it come about that Dr. Mitchell was left OTS and um, began to work for CTC? He was recommended to us by someone in CTC that he should be someone uh, to accompany a team that was going uh, overseas to uh, debrief Abu Zubaydah. Um, just want to make sure I understand. You said he was recommended by someone in CTC? Yes. OK. Just because these, um, these details are important, if you could take a look at um, at paragraph 12 of your declaration. That's on page 2. Page 12 or page par two. paragraph 12, page 2. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. See that at the bottom of the page? Yes. Um, paragraph 12 says, OTS then recommended Dr. Mitchell to CTC Legal, and CTC hired him. OK. Um, was it OTS that recommended Dr. Mitchell to CTC Legal? O OTS recommended it to CTC Legal, and, and, and CTC Legal recommended that he be a person that he should be uh, hired by us. OK. So C CTC Legal recommended to you to hire Dr. Mitchell? Yes. You were responsible for that hiring decision? No. Who was responsible for the hiring decision? Whoever hires people at CIA. Sorry. Objection. I'll withdraw, I'll withdraw the question. Um, OK. Um, and just so the record's clear, can we have the basis for the objection? Uh, Mr. Smith? I am Mr. Smith. Okay. I'm one of Mr. Smith. There's another Smith. <laughs> 
looks uh, like he could pass for me, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, Certainly. So we've, since we've been asked for a uh, full recitation of the objection, I'll read the full thing into the record. Uh, uh, if, if you, you, speak loud, you need to speak louder. Sorry. We've been asked for... We've been asked for uh, a full objection, so I will go ahead and articulate. Okay, before you go, if, if the contention is that it would require the witness to reveal classified information, you could just say that for the record, and that will be fine with me, and I'm sure fine with everyone in the room. Uh, certainly, just want to make sure, since you asked for the full recitation. Um, the, uh, the government objects uh, to the degree that the question would call for classified information or information subject to and, and that therefore subject to an assertion of the state secrets privilege or um, protected from the state secrets, secrets privilege, sorry, or protected from disclosure by the CIA Act, uh, 50 U.S.C. Section 3507, or the National Security Act, 50 U.S.C. Section 3024. Uh, the witness, however, may answer the question if he is confident he can do so on the basis of unclassified and non-privileged information without reference to any of the classico classified categories of information in Government's Exhibit 1. Well, hold it. Excuse me, Bob. I, I'm sorry, the question was withdrawn. I do not want Mr. Rodriguez to have to make that judgment. That's why the government is here. Uh, at this point in time, it's impossible for us to know what is classified and what isn't. So, if he gives the name, are you saying it's okay or not okay? So, uh, he can't give a name. He can't give a can't, name. Okay. Can't. Cannot. I've withdrawn the question, so we're okay. Okay. And I was not going to reveal a name, so. Well, you just quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you asked the question. Okay. Um. When, when Dr. Mitchell was uh, hired by CTC on the recommendation of OTS and then CTC Legal, he um, got a new contract, correct? Correct. Okay. And that con the terms of that contract were that he, um, instead of making $10,000, it was now a contract for $101,600. Do you recall that? I've seen the contract. Okay. If you want, if you need to um, take a look, it's um, exhibit, exhibits A and B. His original contract is exhibit A, and the, the subsequent contract is exhibit B to your declaration. Let me borrow yours, because it's easier to get to the, uh, the uh, exhibits. Okay. Yeah. You need to go off the record for technical reasons. The time is 10.33 a.m. <coughs> time is 10.37 a.m. We're back on the record. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Mr. Rodriguez, did, did you have a chance to look at um, exhibits A and B? Yes. And was I right that the value of the contract went from ten thousand to one hundred one thousand six hundred dollars? Correct, but you should know that he was paid by the hour. So what the contracts people do is they put money into the kitty and they withdraw as he does his work. Okay. Um, so what's the significance of those of the of the price? Um, so it looks like if we look at Exhibit A, I'm sorry. I don't want to ask multiple questions at once. Let's make this the question. It says price not to exceed $10,000. Do you see that? In exhibit A, the first contract. Yeah, yeah. what page? Uh, page one. OK. This is, this is exhibit yes, A. Yes, I see it. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, if you look at exhibit B, it says price to exceed, not to exceed, I'm sorry, $101,600, correct? correct? Mm -hmm. So it could be less, but it couldn't be more. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, other than that, um, Exhibit B makes clear that all other terms and conditions remain in full force and effect, right? Correct. Um, and in particular, um, the services that Dr. Mitchell was to provide was, and I'm looking at, let's look at A, says the contractor 
shall provide consultation and research on counterterrorism and special ops. Do you see that? Uh, let me find. Yep, take your time. I get it. Yes, I see it. Okay. <clears throat> so, just to be clear, um, for in, in Dr. Mitchell's first contract, it described the services as the contractor shall provide consultation and research on counterterrorism and special ops. Special taskings are identified in the previously provided statement of work. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. Um, and the, if you look, uh, bless you, um, to the statement of work, which is several pages later in your exhibit. Okay. I want to ask you about a couple of these, these uh, entries. Um, it says project objectives. And it says, provide consultation to the Professional Standards Advisory Committee. Do you know what that is? No. OK. Um, and it says, regarding applied research in high-risk operational settings. Do you know what research in high-risk operational settings Dr. Mitchell was doing? No. Okay. Um, Under deliverables, it says, provide consultation and recommendations for applying research methodology to meet OTS goals and objectives on a level of effort basis. Do you know what research uh, methodology uh, Dr. Mitchell was consulting and making recommendations about? The only thing that I know is that he was supporting the team that went out there to debrief Abu Zubaydah. Mm -hmm. So do you know anything about what research he was doing in connection with that? No. Um, just to fast forward a bit, if you could look at Exhibit H, this is um, Dr. Jessen's contract. And again, just for the record, this is Exhibit H to Exhibit 36, right? Um, sorry, Mr. Rodriguez. Do, do you recognize this as um, Dr. Jessen's contract? It looks like it. I did, hadn't seen it before. You had not seen it before? I hadn't seen it before I was shown this, this uh, exhibit. I'm sorry, you had not seen it before today? No, before they were, I was shown this exhibit in preparation for this meeting. Okay. Um, this exhibit was attached to your declaration. Did Correct. You I saw it then. Okay. And before that, you had not seen it? No. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether it's Dr. Jessen's contract? It looks like it. Mm -hmm. um, based on your information, did he fulfill the terms of his contract? Yes. Okay. And um, if you turn to the top of the second page of it, it says, services. Do you see that? Yes. 
and the services are task one, provide consultation and recommendations for applying research methodology. You see that? Yes. Then it says C-O-N-U-S. What does C-O-N-U-S stand for? CONUS is the U.S. Okay. And then it says uh, conduct specified applied research projects. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and your testimony is that uh, Dr. Jessen fulfilled the terms of the contract by providing those services. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, so back to Dr. Mitchell for a second. Um, did you select Dr. Mitchell to work with CTC? Once he was recommended and I met uh, Dr. Mitchell, yes, I recommended him to continue working with us. Okay. Um, I want to read you um, a passage from your book. And when I say your book, I'm referring to the book Hard Measures. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. there? That looks like you. That looks um, like me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and. I'll stipulate that. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> You're so reasonable, Mr. Bay. Um, I'm going to just, uh, we're going to just mark as exhibit, um, which one? 37. Some, some, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll mark passages for now. Yep, take your time. So let me put a sticker on here. You have a copy for me, please. No, you can't have it. Okay, I'm easy. Thank you. So this one doesn't. Okay. So, um, if you could take a look at page 55, which is the, the first page. Mm -hmm. See that? Yes. Um, and in the second full paragraph is the sentence, within two days of AZ's capture, we tracked down the contractor and asked if he would accompany a team of CTC officers to the black site where we hoped Abu Zubaydah would be interrogated. Do you see that? Yes. When First of all, the reference to AZ is Abu Zubaydah, correct? Correct. And the reference to the contractor is Dr. Mitchell, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so um, how did you reach him within two days of AZ's capture? Well, I assumed that he was at headquarters. Somebody, you know, somebody reached him. I did not reach him myself. Somebody in the counterterrorism center reached him. Did you know him at that time? I did not know him. So that was the first time that you had met Dr. Mitchell? I met him, yes, for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, though, you were the one who made the decision to hire him at CTC? Yes. Um, why did you think he was qualified? Because of his experience with SEER and because we needed to do something different than what had been done before, and he looked like the right person to do it. Why did he look like the right person to do it? Because he had a tremendous expertise, and uh, he uh, had a good vision for what needed to be done. Okay. What did he have tremendous expertise in? In SEER. What was his uh, SEER experience, to your knowledge, at that time? He had spent many years uh, with the Air Force uh, working on SEER. Did he have, was there any other source of his tremendous expertise? The expertise I was interested in was SEER. Okay. You said he had a good vision for what needed to be done. What was that good vision? The good vision was the use of enhanced interrogations uh, to get Abu Zubaydah to cooperate with us. Okay. Was that his idea? He was a recommendation. And I don't remember exactly who the recommendation came from, but I assume he was part of that recommendation. I'm sorry. Um, he was, you're saying that he was recommended to you? 
that was a recommendation from him regarding the use of the enhanced interrogation techniques. I see. Okay. And that's, so his, the recommendation from him to use enhanced interrogation techniques mm -hmm. was what you mean when you said he had a good vision? Yes. Okay. Um, he had a good vision for how to uh, get this person to tell us about impending attacks on the U.S. Other than Dr. Mitchell's experience at SEER, did he have any other qualifications that you were aware of at that time? Well, he came with a PhD, uh, highly regarded, uh, and then the SEER uh, experience is the one that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. How did you know he was highly regarded? I was told. Okay. Um, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Report, which I know you have some concerns about, says that neither Dr. Mitchell nor Dr. Jessen, quote, had any experience as an interrogator, nor did either have specialized knowledge of Al Qaeda, a background in counterterrorism, or any relevant cultural or linguistic experience. You've read that before, right? I've read that before. And what's your response to that? My response to that is that at some time, sometimes it is important to do something different because what's traditionally been done hasn't worked. And this was something different, and it worked very well. Um, so Dr. Mitchell was proposing, recommending, was your word, something mm -hmm. different, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and that something different, that thinking outside the box, as mm -hmm. you say, was something that made him attractive to you, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and when you say outside the box, I take it that that was different than sort of the standard approaches that other people might have been recommending to you. Correct. Okay. Um, how about the fact that, at, well, let's break down the SSCI statement. It says that um, neither Dr. Mitchell nor Dr. Jessen had any experience as an interrogator. Was that of concern to you? They had experience with SEER. They had experience with counter, uh, countering uh, interrogations. And I thought that was a, a very important uh, issue to understand and to use, to reverse engineer it, to use it to our advantage. Mm -hmm. um, did they? Was it your idea to reverse engineer SEER, or was that Dr. Mitchell's idea? Well, the idea, and I don't know where it came from, the idea was to use that experience uh, offensively to try to get information out of Abu Zubaydah. Mm -hmm. And again, though, uh, that was what was proposed to you by Dr. Mitchell? And a group of people who were working with me. Okay. Um, did it concern you that uh, neither Dr. Mitchell nor Dr. Jessen had any relevant cultural or linguistic experience, as the SSCI report says? Well, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, I think they had a lot more experience uh, in all of this than the record shows. And if you have read his recent book, you see the expertise that he had at dealing with all of these people from that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So. Your view is that when the SSCI report says that, that he did not have, that neither he nor Jessen had any relevant cultural or linguistic experience, that's incorrect? Cor incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, did the, you mentioned that there were a number of people um, that you were discussing um, the, Dr. Mitchell's proposal with? Correct. Um, did any of those other people um, who were working with you have experience with SEER? No. Um, OK, I want to show you, um, so this is what was previously marked as Exhibit 9. Make sure you give a copy to uh, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. I need to put a little. Be marked. So okay. Right 
Sorry, it takes a little time to get all these exhibits around with this gigantic table. <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, do you recognize this document? Uh, no. You've never seen it before? I don't think so. Okay. Um, for the record, it's a document entitled Recognizing and Developing Countermeasures to Al-Qaeda Resistance to Interrogation Techniques, a Resistance Training Perspective, authored by Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen. You see that, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, at the bottom of the executive summary, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen write, we are not experts in Arab culture or the organizational structure of Al Qaeda. You see that? Yes. Um, however, we have found that while culture does affect perception and behavior, the cardinal dynamics of resistance to interrogation and exploitation are not culturally dependent. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yes. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, did you have any questions of them when you met them? Let's take them one at a time. When you first met Dr. Mitchell, did you ask him any questions about his background in terms of um, expertise in Arab culture or the organizational structure of Al-Qaeda? Uh, no, I just observed him uh, in his work. I want to make sure I understand. So you, did you observe him in his work before you met him? I would, as you know from hard measures, I went out to the uh, first site and had a chance to meet him and talk to him and understand uh, what, what his views were. So you had not met him before you went out no. to the site? No, I don't remember meeting him before that. Okay. Um, and reading Hard Measures and actually Dr. Mitchell's book as well, um, Dr. Mitchell says that when he eventually has a meeting with, with you and with Director Tenet and with Mr. Rizzo, mm -hmm. that there were a lot of questions asked of him. Mm -hmm. um, is that correct? I don't remember that. Okay. Do you remember whether any questions were asked about his expertise as either an interrogator or in terms of his I don't culture? remember that. Okay. Just let me finish my question first okay. before you answer. Thank you. Um, um, I can play this, for, play this for you if you wish, but um, in one of the interviews that you did on CBS this morning, you said the following. These people, referring to Drs. Mitchell and Jessen, were experts on the SEER program, mm -hmm. which is a military training program that trains our people how to withstand interrogation tactics. Mm -hmm. They had knowledge and background on Islamic extremism. What knowledge and background on Islamic extremism do you believe that Drs. Mitchell and Jessen had? Well, first of all, uh, their knowledge of psychology uh, human behavior uh, was one that, as he points in his paper here, translates into all cultures. Uh, I saw him, how he dealt with uh, the Arab culture, and I thought, you know, this is a person who understands it and can deal with it. Okay, so um, your belief that they had knowledge and background on Islamic extremism came about as a result of your observations of them during the course of interrogations. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have any other knowledge with regard to their knowledge and background on Islamic extremism? No. Okay. Um, does it, how do you feel about the fact that uh, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen in their um, what I just read to you say that they didn't have knowledge about um, and background on Islamic extremism. I have no feeling about it. Okay. 
Um, I want to ask you for your response to a couple other statements that have been made about Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen's background. Mm -hmm. um, in her book, The Dark Side, Jane Mayer says that according to one colleague who was an interrogator, Mitchell had not even observed an interrogation, referring to prior to, uh, to this, uh, this assignment. Um, do you know whether that's true or not? I do not. Okay. Um, and Ali Sufan from the FBI says the same thing. Um, to your knowledge, is it true that Dr. Mitchell had never even observed an interrogation prior to his assignment? I do not know. Okay. I want to ask you to turn to uh, paragraph 42 of your declaration. And that's on page seven, Mr. Rodriguez. Okay. <clears throat> um, in paragraph forty two A, you say before September 11, 2001, the CTC had no resident expertise in interrogation. Is that correct? True. And when I say is that correct, it's not just that you said it. That was a true fact. True. Okay. Um, and it says in B, to be used effectively, interrogation skills must be developed over years, and that um, interrogation was not a part of the CTC's core counterterrorism mission. Is that true? True. Um, so, were you, um, did you have expertise in interrogation? No. Okay. Um, that is not something that you had done in your prior assignments with the CIA? No. Okay. Um, and um, were you in a position to evaluate then whether somebody was doing a good job at interrogation or not? Uh, only in terms of results. Um, but it was not an area that you had any training or experience in? At the CIA, many times we take on new jobs and we don't have any background or jobs? new jobs and we don't have any uh, training or experience like myself. Uh, I came to CTC. I had never done any CTC work. Mm -hmm. You come and you learn it and you pretty, pretty quickly become pretty knowledgeable about it. Okay. Um, I really want to focus here on Paragraph 42C, the next, par the next subparagraph down. You see that? Yes. And that says, having been referred to the CTC by the OTS, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen were eminently qualified to assist the CTC in developing and applying EITs. You see that? Yes. Um, the, f the fact that um, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen, well, first of all, it says, Strike that. Let me start over. Try to ask a decent question. Um, as you point out, that they were referred, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen were referred to the CTC by the OTS. Is that correct? Yes. Um, is it true that Dr. Jessen was referred to the CTC by the OTS? Jessen was, uh, Mitchell was referred, uh, Mitchell was referred, uh, Jessen. Uh, was referred by Mitchell. Okay. Um, so, is the fact that they were referred to the CTC by the OTS um, one of the reasons why you believe they were, quote, eminently qualified to assist the CTC in developing and applying EITs? Yes. Okay. What about the reference from the OTS led you to conclude that they were eminently qualified? I just took it for granted that they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And you took it for granted based upon the uh, referral from the OTS. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago that, um, that uh, Dr. Jessen was referred to you by Dr. Mitchell. Is that right? Yes. What, did you make the decision to hire Dr. Jessen? Yes. What did you do to vet him? Anything? N nothing. 
You just took Dr. Mitchell's word for it. Well, you know, there's a whole vetting process that takes place at the agency and the contract people and the security people, they take care of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, paragraph 39 on the same page, right above where we were, you see that? Same page seven, you got that? Yes, I see it. Okay, thank you. Um, you say, at or about the conclusion of this meeting, and you're referring to a meeting in July of 2002, mm -hmm. if you want to look back to make sure I'm right about that. Um, this was a meeting that you had with at headquarters that Dr. Mitchell attended in July of 2002? Correct. Okay. And you say at the conclusion of the meeting that you, on behalf of CTC, asked Dr. Mitchell to consider working with the CIA to use some or all of the EITs to interrogate Zubaida, right? True. Okay. And then the next paragraph says, at or about this time, Dr. Mitchell requested that Dr. Jessen be hired by the CTC to assist Dr. Mitchell with the CTC's request. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, was there any discussion about why Dr. Jessen should be hired? He just needed him uh, to work with him. Mm -hmm. Did he explain why he needed him? No. Okay. And did you ask any questions about Dr. Jessen at that I time? I don't remember. Okay. You may have? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. So you don't remember whether or not you asked any questions? I don't remember. Okay. Which means you may have, but you just don't recall. I don't remember. Um, would you agree that as Dr. Mitchell's book describes him, he was, quote, the architect of the CIA interrogation program? Who, do, who describes him? In, uh, uh, can, we, can we pull that? We're going to show you what has been previously marked as Exhibit 4 in this case. let everybody else get their copies. Mm -hmm. Sorry. As I said, it takes a little longer because of this big table. Um, if you look at the cover page, mm -hmm. it says, Interrogating the Enemy, the Story of the CIA's Interrogation of Top Al-Qaeda Terrorists, Working Title by James E. Mitchell, Ph.D. And then it says, Architect of the CIA Interrogation Program. And my question is, do you agree with the characterization of James E. Mitchell, Ph.D. as the architect of the CIA Interrogation Program? Yes. yes. Objected? Yeah. So I didn't, at the beginning, uh, talk to you as I should have about objections. Um, this I is, did. Okay. So since your attorney has instructed you, when there's an objection, unless your attorney directs you not to answer, you should answer anyway, which you did. Hmm. So your answer to that question was yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you agree that, um, that Dr. Mitchell was the architect of the CIA interrogation program? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to a couple other passages from, from this book. Um, Mr. Lofsburg, just so we're clear, Matt, this is not the book. Guys, it's a draft. That's correct. Um, so just to be clear, what I've shown you is a, um, is a manuscript that was submitted. It, it's, we're not using the final version of the book. I don't think that there's any differences, but OK. Um, well, know that that passage was removed that you just read to the place. Right. I'm, 
I was, I was, I, I was, record, there are differences. I don't think you need to do that. Do okay. I asked him about whether he agreed with the characterization, and he said yes. Um, um, directing your attention to pages 54 and 55 of the manuscript. Fifty-four and fifty-five. Let me just see if I can find it. Um, and actually, uh, the page fifty-four describes the meeting that we were just discussing. Do you see that? What paragraph? No, page fifty-four. Page fifty-four. Oh, 54. Mm -hmm. Looking at the first, first full paragraph on page 55, Dr. Mitchell writes, a day or so later, Rodriguez asked me if I would help put together an interrogation program using AITs. You see that? Yes. Um, is that true? True. It's true that you did ask him to do that? Yes. To put together an interrogation program? Correct. OK. And in particular, if you go a little further down that paragraph, it says, Jose not only wanted me to help them craft the program, he wanted me to conduct the interrogations using EITs myself. Um, was it correct that you wanted him uh, to craft the program? Correct. Okay. And just going back to, what's the, what's the exhibit number for his book? No, his book. Yeah. Okay, going back to the excerpts from your own book, mm -hmm. Mr. Rodriguez. And, and by the way, just let me backtrack. In, in the passages I read to you from Dr. Mitchell's manuscript, when it talked about Mr. Rodriguez or Rodriguez and Jose, those referred to you? Yes. I mean, when, it, when his description of what occurred was accurate if that, that was you, Jose Rodriguez, who was being referred to, correct? Unless it was the barber downstairs that I <laughs> told you about before. Um, do you have any? I was the only Jose Rodriguez at the agency, I think, at the time. So. The, the barber downstairs wasn't, that wasn't there. Wasn't, yeah. He wasn't at those meetings. Uh, I'm sorry. I just had to say <laughs> no, no, I, I, we, we need that. Um, um, OK, um, just directing your attention in your own book to mm -hmm. um, page 62. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Thanks, Jim. Sixty-two. Page sixty-two, which is the second page. Thank you. In the first full paragraph on page sixty-two. Mm -hmm. The, um, you write, I asked the contractor, and mm -hmm. the contractor refers to Dr. Mitchell, correct? Does the contractor refer to Dr. Mitchell? Yes. OK. How long it would take if we employed more aggressive but legal techniques before he would know whether a detainee was willing to cooperate or was so dedicated that he would take any secrets he had with him to the grave? 30 days was his estimate. I thought about it overnight, and the next morning asked the contractor if he would be willing to take charge of creating and implementing such a program. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes. Um, so is it correct that you asked Dr. Mitchell if he would take charge of creating and implementing a program? Yes. And that program was the program of enhanced interrogation techniques. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And 
you were under instructions at that time from Director Tenet to develop a, an interrogation program. Is that right? Correct. Um, so, I just want to make sure I understand what happened then, and I would direct your attention for purposes of that to paragraph 46 of your declaration, which is Exhibit 36. On page 8 of the declaration. Yes. You see that? Um, so this refers to a meeting on July 8th, 2002 at headquarters with Drs. Mitchell and Jessen. If you look at paragraph 44, you see that? Yes. And in paragraph 46 it says, at the conclusion of this meeting, I requested that Drs. Mitchell and Jessen provide me with a written list identifying the potential EITs, describing how they would be implemented and identifying their intended effects upon Zubeda. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and they, in fact, did that, correct? Correct. If you look at Exhibit J to your, um, to your uh, declaration, is that the list of EITs that, um, that they provided as a result of your request? Yes. And that, uh, let me, with just withdrawn. If you go to the next page, paragraph 49 of your declaration. Page nine. Uh, page nine, paragraph 49, sorry. I just want to ask you about that, par that paragraph 49. It says, during July 2002, with Drs. Mitchell and Jessen's input only as requested, the CTC began devising an interrogation plan for Zubeda utilizing some or all of the EITs, here and after the EIT program. Um, so was, was the EIT program based upon the list that uh, Dr. Mitchell had provided to you? Yes. Um, and you've um, discussed in many places the fact that, however, you wouldn't implement that until you got approval. Correct. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, but you sought permission for all of those techniques, correct? Correct. Okay. And just so that the record is clear, the techniques for which you sought approval were, and we can follow along if you want to on um, Exhibit J. Were the attention grasp, walling, facial hold, facial slap, cramped confinement, wall standing, stress positions, sleep deprivation, waterboard, use of diapers, insects, and mock burial. Now, I'm not asking what got approved. I'm asking whether those were the techniques for which you requested approval. Yes. Um, and, and again, those are the techniques that are set forth in the list that was provided by Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen, correct? Yes. Um, did you request approval for techniques other than those that were set forth on the list provided by Dr. Mitchell and Jessen? I don't recall that. Okay. And um, this became 
this became the formal interrogation, ultimately, when, when there was approval granted for at least some of them, this became the formal interrogation plan of CTC. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and in particular, if you look at, in your declaration, don't worry about that. Just asking. Just yeah, asking. don't worry about that. Yeah. Just asking. <laughs> oh, about the, about the objection? Objection, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> to be honest, neither do I, but he knows, so that's good. Um, If you look at paragraph 58 on page 10 of your declaration, This talks about the, um, the Zubeda formal interrogation plan. And there's a cable, which is Exhibit M. If you could pull out Exhibit M. M, -M. M as in Mary. Wait, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. In your declaration, you state that um, the cable constituted Zubeda's formal interrogation plan. Um, and just referring to that exhibit, if you look at the second page, paragraph four, you see where it says background? Yes. Do you see the list of enhanced interrogation techniques that are listed there? Correct. It's a fact, isn't it, that those are the same enhanced interrogation te techniques. Let me try that again. They're the same enhanced interrogation techniques as are set forth in Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen's memo to you, other than the mock burial, right? I believe that's right. Okay. If, if, it, it's important. It's important facts. If you could take a look and, and see if that's. I mean, mock burial was definitely out, mm -hmm. and I think that's the only one. Okay. Um, so, is it fair <laughs> to say, Mr. Rodriguez, that uh, doctors Mitchell and Jessen? So proposal became the enhanced interrogation techniques program for the CAA? Yes. Um, and if you look at <clears throat> exhibit I to your declaration, What is that? What is Exhibit I? You asking me? Yes. The if cable? You the cable, you mean? Mm-hmm. I'll have to read it. Yeah, take your time. I'm going to eventually direct your attention to paragraph five, which is on the second page of the cable, which has a list of pressure techniques. No 
no date. Well, it says date seven, seven with no date, 2002. So okay. July 2002. I don't know if it's July. I mean, the okay. date matters, but. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Where it says let here. Let me finish up. I'm please. sorry, I apologize. Take, your, take as much time mm -hmm. as you need. Paragraph 44. Paragraph. Paragraph 44. It's not that long for bigger reason. Do you guys take your time? Just let me know when you're ready. Yeah. To so what's your question? Okay. My question is under five. It mm -hmm. says the below techniques are the menu of the pre-approved interrogation techniques. When it says pre-approved, who pre-approved them? Objection. Okay. Let me, I'll withdraw the question. Were you the person who pre-approved them? No. Okay. Um, did, did you approve these techniques that Drs. Mitchell and Jessen proposed, though? I mean, if the cable went out under my name, I did. But I don't remember it. Okay. So you don't recall whether you approved them? If the cable went out under my name, it meant I approved them. Mm -hmm. So I take responsibility for it, but I don't recall this specific cable here. Um, just to go back to what I was asking you about before, if you look through five, it's the same exact list um, other than the mock burial that we were talking about before. Right. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, and do, that was the list that was provided by Drs. Mitchell and Jessen? Correct. Um, do you, did, did you, uh, did anybody other than, and you don't, don't say who, did any, anybody other than Drs. Mitchell and Jessen propose other techniques to you? I don't recall. There may have been others? I don't recall. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you propose any other list other than this list to Mr. Rizzo or to no. the department? Let me finish my question, okay? Okay, yeah. let's stop there, though. So you never proposed any other list other than this list to Mr. No. Rizzo? Did you propose any other list other than this list to the Department of Justice? No. Okay. Um,
And is it true that the reason that you used Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen's list was because they were the experts that you trusted to come up with such a list? True. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, you um, believe them when they said, for example, that 30 days was the amount of time it would take to figure out whether the techniques were working. Yes. Um, and because that was what they said, the techniques would in fact be applied for up to 30 days, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you agree that at that time, um, that is the time that the Dr. Drs. Mitchell and Jessen proposed the enhanced interrogation techniques that Dr. Mitchell had acquired, quote unquote, tremendous influence in the process? Well, he was highly respected for his knowledge on SEER, and we all respected him, yes. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you agree that he had tremendous influence? He had tremendous respect. Mm -hmm. okay. um, certainly, in, in terms of what occurred, his views were taken into account, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and um, the, I just want to, if you turn to your declaration at page, um, at paragraph 77. And that refers to an exhibit P. Okay. It says, paragraph 77 says, thereafter EIT program procedures used on Zubeda were formalized in various documents. And when you state, when you use the phrase EIT program procedures used on Zubeda, you're referring to the EITs that were, um, that were provided by Drs. Mitchell and Jessen. Yes. Um, I'm just going to, can we just take a brief break for one sec? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Because you're a young guy. I'm, I'm Thank you. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, before the lunch break, we were discussing the process whereby you um, sought and obtained uh, legal authorization for the um, for the for the enhanced interrogation technique program, remember that? Yes. And um, when you sought that uh, that uh, approval, it was based upon what you had learned from doctors Mitchell and Jessen with regard to the SEER program, correct? Correct. Okay. And what exactly were you told about the applicability of the SEER program to these? To, to these techniques? Objection. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, question is withdrawn. It's a good objection. What were you told by, um, by, Mitchell, by Drs. Mitchell and Jessen about the applicability of the SEER program to these techniques? That there was a good chance it could work. Mm -hmm. um, were you told, was, was there any discussion of whether the differences between the SEER program, which is applied to students, what the differences would be between that program and applying these to detainees in captivity? Well, I don't remember a particular discussion about that, but I'm sure that it was considered. You answered the question. Mm -hmm. You don't remember a discussion of that? I don't remember a discussion about that. OK. Um, so can I have um, plaintiffs 18? So he's okay. entitled to Full answers, but not speculation or guesswork. I'm happy for speculation and guesswork. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> is that another one of your markings? Is this is previously oh, okay. marked.
Let me know when you've had a chance to okay. take a look at that. <coughs> I'm actually just going to ask you about a sentence on the first into the second page, but you can, I mean, you feel free to read the whole document if you want to. Okay. Just let me know when you're ready. Okay. 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 Um, just directing your attention to the bottom of the first page. Uh, well, first of all, have you ever seen this document before? Uh, I don't recollect seeing this document. Okay. Um, it, at the bottom of the first page, it says, um, a bottom line in considering the new measures proposed for use at blank is that subject is being held in solitary confinement against his will without legal representation as an enemy of our country, our society, and our people. Therefore, while the techniques described in headquarters meetings and below are administered to student volunteers in the US in a harmless way with no measurable impact on the psyche of the volunteer, we do not believe we can assure the same here for a man forced through these processes and who will be made to believe this is the future course of the remainder of his life. Station blank, COB and blank personnel will make every effort possible to ensure that subject is not permanently physically or mentally harmed, but we should not say at the outset of this process that there is no risk. Um, did you ever, did, have you ever, you, you say you haven't seen that before? I don't think I've seen it. Okay, did you have discussions along those lines with Drs. Mitchell or Jessen? I don't remember having any discussions with okay. them on that. Um, when you sought approval um, for their enhanced interrogation technique program, um, was, was this information that was provided by you, at least, to the Department of Justice? What information? This, what I just read. The fact that there was, uh, we should not say at the outset of this process that there is no risk because this is different than the CO program. Uh, I don't recall that. Okay. Um, do you 
have any recollection at all of either Dr. Mitchell or Dr. Jessen having a discussion with you about the distinctions between the application of these techniques in, in the context of the SEER program versus in the context of a, a detainee? I don't recall that. I'm going to read you, and I can show it to you if you wish, but I'm going to read you a quote from the CIA Office of Inspector General report. You've seen that report, right? Yes. CIA Office of Inspector General. You've seen that report? I saw that report okay. many years ago. Okay. I just want to get your reaction to this sentence. Finally, the agency presented OLC, that's Office of Legal Counsel, with a psychological profile of Abu Zubaydah, with the conclusions of officials and psychologists associated with the SEER program that the use of EITs would cause no long-term mental harm. OLC relied on these representations to support its conclusion that no physical harm or prolonged mental harm would result from the use on him of the EITs, including the water board. Do you agree with that? Yes. Favor us with an exhibit number and page that you're reading from? Certainly. Um, so it was, um, it, was, it was a previously exhibit 10, and it's paragraph 43 from exhibit, from what we previously had marked as exhibit 10. Do I, do I agree I with the fact that we would not? The question was, do, do I agree with the assertion that the enhanced interrogation techniques would not cause permanent harm, correct? Um, do you agree that, that that was the information that was provided to OLC by the CIA? I don't know that. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't know whether, um, whether that was the representation that was made to, the, to OLC? I do not know that. Okay. Were you involved in putting together the submission to, to the Department of Justice? I uh, was not. Okay. Okay, just um, actually, let me, sorry. Uh, yeah, great, thank you. Okay, um, I read you a passage from that OLC report, and there's a footnote that I'm now going to read you and see if, what your reaction is to that. And again, I'm happy to show it to you if it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, One moment. Oh, uh, no, it's not. You're right. You're right. It's the. It's the. It's the. You're correct. It's the. Um, OIG. Of the, the OIG's report. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you. Ex correct. That is what it is, right? Exhibit ten. I, I just want to make sure you're following. Um, <laughs> It's, it, 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 is, it is Exhibit 10. Page, I'm now reading from footnote 26 on page 21 of Exhibit 10. According to the Chief Medical Services, OMS was neither consulted nor involved in the initial analysis of the risk and benefits of EIT, nor provided with the OTS report cited in the OLC opinion. In retrospect, based on the OLC extracts of the OTS report, OMS contends that the reported sophistication of the preliminary EIT review was exaggerated, at least as it related to the water board, and that the power of this EIT was ap appreciably overstated in the report. Furthermore, OMS contends that the expertise of the SEER psychologist interrogators on the water board was probably misrepresented at that time, as the SEER water board experience is so different from the subsequent agency usage as to make it almost irrelevant. Consequently, according to OMS, there was no a priori reason to believe that applying the water board with the frequency and intensity with which it was used by the psychologist interrogators was either efficacious or medically safe. What's your reaction to that? Well, I object to the form of the question. I don't know what you mean by reaction. That Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll restate it. Let me break it down. Do you believe, in retrospect, that 
the, um, that the, let's take it piece by piece, um, that withdrawn. Um, it says, OMS contends that the expertise of the seer psychologist interrogators on the waterboard was probably misrepresented at the time as the seer waterboard experience is so different from the subsequent agency usage as to make it almost irrelevant. Was that a matter that was discussed with you? The OIG report? Nope. Um, the, the, the idea that the waterboard experience is so different from the subsequent agent, the SEER waterboard experience is so different from the subsequent agency usage. No. It was not discussed with you. No. Um, so let me make sure I understand. Doctors Mitchell and Jessen advocated for a particular set of enhanced interrogation techniques based upon their SEER experience, correct? Correct. But there was never a discussion about whether that experience was actually relevant to the experience of detainees. Is that correct? Perhaps there was a discussion somewhere in the agency. I am sure there was. Fair enough. With you? Was Not it? with me. Okay. Or that I recall. Okay. Have you done any analysis yourself of whether there is a difference between the application of these techniques in the SEER school setting versus in the setting of a detainee in captivity? No. Have you asked anybody any questions about that? Because, well, did you have, have you had, do you have any concerns about that as you sit here right now? No. Okay. Why is that? Should, there's no reason for it. Mm -hmm. So you have no concerns at all that there's a, that, that the experience in the SEER setting might be so different from the experience in the detainee setting that it would be wrong to draw conclusions about the harmfulness or harmlessness of the technique based upon what happened in the SEER school? No, I don't. Okay. And again, why is that? I just don't. And, is, is, and you don't because you don't think that, that the differences are germane? I just don't have any, uh, any idea. I mean, okay. I assume that I, I, I believe that the experiences uh, actually work very well mm -hmm. and therefore uh, were successful. So the classroom instruction at SEER helped us tremendously. So let me just break that down. The, you think that the, the classroom setting at, in SEER is close enough to what happened to somebody in captivity that, that those experiences are a good way of measuring whether there's harm. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, um, did you ever raise yourself, raise that question with anybody? No. Okay. Um, and when you say that, um, that, all, that this was successful, what you mean is that from your perspective, it got good results. It got good results. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that it good, got good results leads you to believe that it was worth doing, even if there were differences between the SEER classroom and, and, the, and the detainee in captivity? To be perfectly honest, I've never thought about it. OK. Uh, I think you said before you, had no, you have no personal experience yourself with SEER. Is that right? True. You've never been to a SEER classroom? No. Just a couple more questions on this subject. Um, many of the 
tell me if this is correct, many of the detainees that were captured, including Abu Zubaydah, were wounded or injured at the time, right? Not true. That is not true. That is not true. Okay. And most of the things we've been discussing so far is Abu Zubaydah, mm -hmm. uh, not others. Right. Um, I'm asking you the question of, so Abu Zubaydah was, a, was wounded at, at the time? He was, yes. Okay. And um, other detainees, were there other detainees in your knowledge who were wounded at the time they were taken into captivity? Uh, perhaps, but most of them were not wounded. Okay. Um, for someone who was wounded, would that be a different experience than what they had, uh, to your knowledge, uh, under, uh, that had occurred at, in the SEER setting? I do not know. Okay. So you don't know whether SEER students were were wounded or injured at the time that they underwent. I assume program. they were not. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of the question. Do you know yeah, whether okay. they were wounded or okay. injured? Okay. Yeah. Or injured something at the time or something? <laughs> so you don't know whether SEER students, at the time they were under, they were experiencing these te techniques, were wounded or injured? Do you know? I do not know. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Um, were you concerned at all that some, some of the CIA officials who were, or others working with them who were applying these techniques would sometimes go beyond what they were permitted to do? Yes. And how did, what did you do with, res with respect to that concern? When we found out, we uh, reported it self-reported, and turn it over to the IG. Mm -hmm. um, the IG? IG, the Inspector General. Mm -hmm. Why were you concerned that that would happen? In every endeavor of this sort, people uh, do stupid things, and don't follow regulation, and eventually some people did. Mm -hmm. When you say um, an endeavor of this sort, an endeavor of what sort? A big covert action complex program involving so many moving parts. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a big complex program with many moving parts, some people are going to step over the line, correct? Some people are going to do stupid things, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you have any view of whether that would be likely to happen in SEER school? I have no view. Okay. SEER, the SEER school participants were there voluntarily. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes. Do you think that that makes a difference in terms of whether they were likely to suffer, um, like strike that, and so and so they could leave at any time, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Do you think that makes a difference in terms of the psychological damage that they would suffer, as opposed to detainees who could not leave whenever they wanted to? Uh, the detainees could stop it if they wanted to. So your answer is that because the detainees could stop it by giving the answers that you wanted them to give, they were there voluntarily as well? If that's the way you want to put it, yes. Well, that's not the way. I'm asking you. Were they there voluntarily? They were not there voluntarily, mm -hmm. but they could stop the interrogation if they agreed to comply. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Abu Zubaydah for a second. Even after he began to, imply, to comply, he was still waterboarded, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And even though Dr. Mitchell and Jessen recommended that he not be waterboarded anymore, it continued, right? Correct. And that was because it was still within that 30-day period, right? No. That's not true? No. Okay. Um, so I need um, Mitchell's. <clears throat> Mitchell book, pages 88 to 90. Mitchell's book. Okay. So um, you have, oh, you have it? Okay. So if you could, you have um, exhibit four, which is uh, the manuscript. It's this big one. This one? Yes. The manuscript of Dr. Mitchell's book. Page four? Page 88. It's uh, exhibit four. Exhibit four, page mm -hmm. 88. Actually, um, it's 
actually, let's go to um, bear with me. Okay, um, on page 88, line 15, it says, as Abu Zubaydah began to offer up information that the targeters and analysts on site judged valuable and wanted more of, we asked for permission to stop using EITs, especially the waterboard. Do you see that? Yes. To our surprise, however, headquarters ordered us to continue waterboarding him. Do you see that? Yes. Is that true? Yes. Um, were you involved in ordering uh, Doctors Mitchell and Jessen to continue to waterboard Abu Zubaydah? Yes. Why? Well, I was the head of it, and my analysts were concerned that perhaps he was not compliant. Mm -hmm. um, it says, for several days, and starting on line 18, for several days in a row, uh, Dr. Mitchell writes, we questioned the necessity of continuing the EITs. But every day we received cables, phone calls, or emails instructing us to continue waterboarding Abu Zubaydah. At one point, Bruce and I pushed back hard and threatened to quit. We were told, quote, he's turning you. You are not turning him. The officers we were dealing with, mid-level CTC officials, really pissed us off by saying, you've lost your spines. They insisted that if we didn't keep waterboarding Abu Zubaydah and another attack happened in the United States, it would be, quote, unquote, your fault. Um, is, this, is that, to your knowledge, true? Uh, I, I don't know what mid-level officials will tell, were telling uh, Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Did you direct any mid-level officials to say that kind of thing to Mitchell? No. Um, so um, if you turn if you turn to page 90, middle of the page, line 10, it says, it refers to a video conference, and it says, Jose Rodriguez chaired the video conference. My take was that he was trying to be an honest arbitrator of the issue. He seemed focused on preventing another attack inside the United States and wanted to do it in the most straightforward way possible. He was being assailed by advocates on both sides of the argument, but seemed objective and not locked in on any one approach. We showed the videotape and voiced our opinion that we didn't need to continue using EITs, especially waterboarding. Not surprisingly, some in the room with Rodriguez objected. One or two objected vigorously. They insisted we continue waterboarding Abu Zubaydah for at least 30 days. That's when it dawned on me that my answer months before to Jose Rodriguez's question about how long it would take for me to believe a person subjected to EITs, quote, either didn't have the information or was going to take it to the grave with them, had come back to haunt us. I pointed out that comment was made before waterboarding was incorporated into the list of potential EITs and didn't apply anymore. My question is, was, is, is Dr. Mitchell correct that the reason he was ordered to continue waterboarding was because it was still within the 30-day period? No. He's wrong about that? Yes. Okay. Um, your knowledge, were the long-term effects of the use of SEER techniques ever studied? Not to my knowledge. Um, were, how about, um, are you aware of any studies on the use of those techniques uh, with regard to people who are being held against their will? No. Do you have any knowledge about whether the use of the enhanced interrogation techniques would be expected to produce a post-traumatic stress disorder? No. Did you ever ask anybody whether the effects of whether uh, the use of the enhanced um, interrogation techniques would, would be expected to produce post-traumatic stress disorder? No.
so I want this document. Um, do we have this marked? We have to mark this? Okay. So this is going to be Exhibit 39. Um, it's a long document, and I'm going to be asking you about a section on um, the page that has the number Bates stamp 001763 at the bottom. It's the second to last page. Okay, let me just read quickly. Yeah, take your time. Take your time. See I don't what, need to what else? This is. Um, while you're doing that, for the record, Mr. Smith and I discussed this as well in my representation before lunch about those documents that we regarded as business records, I may have been too narrow in just, in just limiting them to cables. This is a memo, and our, our agreement these are, um, as the business records encompasses this whole set of documents. Correct. So just so we're clear, with this that you're making reference to is Exhibit 39, correct? Okay. But I thought that what you contemplated was all of the documents produced by the government, 100%. We're going to stipulate that they're authentic, and we're going to stipulate that we don't need to call a custodian to qualify them as business records. Right. And that you don't need to, none of us need to question Mr. Rodriguez as to whether they satisfy the requirements of business records. I you wanted some questions to that. How I <laughs> That would be much more fun. I didn't get my witness fee. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll come up with that quickly. <laughs> it's 40 now. Oh, wow. No. Uh, <laughs> Plus we need lunch. Yes, minus lunch. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the page I referenced, which is Bates number 001763, there's a paragraph 7, and under paragraph 7, there's a subsection. Um, that says, the absence of any specific intent to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering. In a letter dated 13th of July, 2002, OLC advised CIA that specific intent can be negated by a showing of good faith. If, for example, efforts were made to determine what long-term impact, if any, specific conduct would have, and it was learned that the conduct would not result in prolonged mental harm, any actions taken relying on that advice would have to be undertaken in good faith. Due diligence to meet this standard might include such actions as surveying professional literature, consulting with experts, or evidence gained from past experience. Do you see that? Yes. Um, was, to your knowledge, were efforts made to determine what long-term impact, if any, specific conduct would have? And the specific conduct I'm referring to here is the uh, Dr. Mitchell's and Dr. Jessen's in, uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. I do not know. Um, this is referencing a letter from July 13th, 2002, from OLC to CIA. Do you remember such a letter? No. Okay. Um, so um, do, you, do you have any recollection of the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ advising CIA that, um, that due diligence to meet the standard might include such actions as surveying professional literature, consulting with experts, or evidence gained from past experience? No. 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 I don't have any uh, recollection of that. Okay. <coughs> so, did you, in your capacity as the director of CTC at that time, 
order requ or request anyone to conduct the type of research or due diligence that's described in that paragraph? No. Would you agree that you don't, that the long-term effects of the enhanced interrogation techniques was never explored in real depth? I do not know. Okay. Do you think it should have been? I don't know. Do you, do you think it's possible that the enhanced interrogation techniques could result in long-term harm? Objection. Objection. Does that mean I answer it, or? Uh, well, I object to the word possible, but go ahead if you can. Go ahead and can you repeat the question, yeah, please? I understand. Let me try to reword it in a way that will satisfy Mr. Bennett, which is what I really want to do here. <laughs> Thank um, you so much. Do you think that the enhanced interrogation techniques could result in long-term harm? No. Why is that? It never did. I don't think any of the individuals that we held in captivity has suffered any long-term effects. What do you base that on? Just what I've known from the project and from what I've been told. Mm -hmm. So you've received information that all of the detainees who were subjected to the enhanced interrogation techniques are fine and have not suffered long-term harm? I have not received information on all on some. Mm -hmm. So have you received any information that any of them are suffering any long-term physical or psychological effects? No. Okay. I'm, um, I'm sure you will remember this uh, back and forth with Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes, where you um, analogized the stress positions to um, working out in a gym. Correct. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that's a good analogy to what the, the kind of discomfort that the stress positions cause? I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. So you don't know? I answer. don't know. And how about sleep deprivation? Do you really think sleep deprivation is a lot like jet lag? Having suffered from jet, uh, from jet lag uh, and not being able to sleep for two or three days, I can imagine it being a very devastating thing to, to go through. OK. Um, how was, to your knowledge, sleep deprivation affected? That is, how, how were people deprived of sleep um, under using the enhanced interrogation techniques? Uh, they get confused. Uh, they they uh, uh, have a harder time trying to figure out what they said in the, in the past. Uh, they become disoriented. Uh, it's just very difficult to keep up lying uh, when you are sleep deprived. OK. So I asked that question poorly, because what I really meant to ask you was, what did people there do to deprive the detainees of sleep? Didn't let them sleep. How did, they, how, did they, how did they not let them sleep? What did they do to not let them sleep? I assume that they woke them up. Mm -hmm. I am dead. Did you, you observe some interrogations, right? Uh, no. You never observed any? No. How about on videotape? No. You never saw one once? No. There was a, a little videotape one time, but it was just a, but it was not a, a videotape of anything that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have any direct knowledge of the way in which people were kept awake? No. Um, so no, not, for example, uh, pouring water on them or, uh, or any other techniques? You don't know what was used to keep no. them awake? No idea? No. One moment, I'm getting close to being done here. In your, um, in what you've written um, about doctors Mitchell and Jessen, you have 
um, talked about the fact that they were not the ones who would decide who these techniques would be used on. Is that right? Correct. Who, who dis well, um, never mind, because that's going to get an objection. Um, <coughs> were they, did you tell them that they were not, that they were not the ones to decide who the enhanced interrogation techniques would be used on? They were contractors, independent contractors. Everybody knows that independent contractors don't make decisions, that the staff people are the ones making decisions. So that even though they designed the program, they were not the ones to decide who it would be used on. Is that right? Correct. OK. Um, and um, to your knowledge, based upon your interaction with them, did they know um, that their techniques would be used on people that they did not select? I don't know that. Um, at the end of your declaration, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you have a section on the SSCI report beginning on page 19. Paragraph 121. Um, and on, in paragraph 122, you say that the SSCI report is an errant, one sided assault on the CIA's EIT program that reaches numerous unsupportable and baffling conclusions. Um, and then you give an example on paragraph, in paragraph 125, where you say that the SSCI report states that on July 17, 2002, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice requested a delay in the approval of the interrogation techniques. In fact, on that date, Rice approved the CIA's use of EIT subject to DOJ approval. You see that? Yes. Um, how um, is that the only example? It's the only example you give of ways in which the SSCI report is errant and one sided. Um, is, are there other examples? Of course. Uh, can you provide another one? The uh, allegation that the enhanced interrogation program did not work and that no value came from them is totally erroneous. It's a travesty. Okay, so, so you're, you believe that, the, um, that what the SSCI report it says is that the enhanced inter interrogation program did not work and that no value came from it? Correct. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Um, the CIA wrote a response to the SSCI report, right? Correct. Did you read that? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you participate in assisting to draft that? No. Or? Okay. Um, is that, would you say that that response was also errant or one-sided? I don't think so, but I don't, I don't remember it. Okay. Let me show you a couple of conclusions from that report. Um, is this a new exhibit? Yeah. It's Exhibit 21 already marked. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What page? Um, page 25. Sure about that. Is short is twenty five? Says we agree. Where's this? I don't see it there. Oh, sorry. There's there's, there's different page. There's two different page twenty fives, or at least two. So <laughs> the uh, towards the 
end of the report, the, the page numbers go again. And are you sure that this is the right one? Hold on one second. Just wait. Well, I'm sorry. Go. Up. Just give us one minute to okay. get the make sure we have the right page twenty five. Sorry. I got it. It's, it's just, okay. Do we have Bates numbers on these? I don't think so. It's the first page 25. No, it's not. It's the second page. Okay, so there's numerous, this gets numbered <laughs> a couple of different times. The second page 25, which is sort of, um, unfortunately, these are not Bates numbered, so this is not that easy to work with. Um, but um, it's um, about halfway through. It's, a, it's part of conclusion 10. Conclusion 10? Yes. Um, and I'm, that's what I'm looking. Correct. So let me look. Let me, let me, let me see if Mr. Shulky maybe has a good way to do it. So yes, this is the second series of numbers. So if you look, you'll see it goes 1 through 20. It goes, it 18. starts, and then it renumbers again. You're responsible for this confusing document, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> this one? This one? Yep. This one. Um, no, it starts at the top of the page. It's page 25. It's at the very top of the page. It starts with CIA remains grateful. Okay. Here it is. Here. At this. Right here. Where's that, by the way? I got it. It's actually the second, I think. Hank, but whatever. All right. Well, we got it. Here. You got it. Uh, maybe. maybe it, anyway, you got it. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was... It says, we agree, in, in the first bullet point, it says, we agree with the study, however, that, that they, being um, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen, were heavily reliant on the views of the practitioner. I'm sorry. Um, it says, CRA remains grateful to blank and blank who applied, pardon me. Yeah, I'm, I know. Um, oh, I see. Withdrawn. The second bullet point. As discussed in our response to Conclusion 17, we agree that CIA should have done more from the beginning of the program to ensure there was no conflict of interest, real or potential, with regard to the contractor psychologists who designed and executed the techniques, while also playing a role in evaluating their effectiveness as well as other closely related tasks. Do you see that? Yes, I see that. OK. Um, first of all, do you? First of all, I mean, obviously, you agree that the contractor psychologists that we're talking about are doctors Mitchell and Jessen, yes. right? Yes. Um, and that they were the one, and the reason you say that is because they were, in fact, the ones who um, designed and executed te techniques. Um, but do you also agree that their company or they played a role in evaluating their effectiveness? Objection. Yes. They did? They played a role, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, do you, do, you think, do, you, do you think that's problematic? No, because we also, the agency played a role in assessing their effectiveness. The agency also assessed their effectiveness? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did, were you involved in that? For, not formally, but in, in measuring their accomplishments, I was. Mm -hmm. Um, later on, let me see if I have the right numbers here, on page 40, on page 48, same series. Look at the conclusion 17 on the top of page 48. Mm -hmm. It says, the CAA improperly used two private contractors with no relevant experience to develop, operate, and assess the CIA detention and interrogation program. 
In 2005, the contractors formed a company specifically for the purpose of expanding their detention and interrogation work with the CIA. Shortly thereafter, virtually all aspects of the CIA's detention and interrogation program were outsourced to the company. By 2006, the value of the base contract with the company with all options exercised was in excess of $180 million. In 2007, the CIA signed a multi-year indemnification agreement protecting the company and its employees from legal liability. I know. That's the language from the SSCI report, right? This is from the uh, CIA response? Right. So they're, they're responding to that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and on the next page, it says, we acknowledge that the agency erred in permitting the contractors to assess the effectiveness of enhanced techniques. You see that? In the next, in next page. Page 49? 49, yep, the very top. They should not have been considered for such a role given their financial interest in continued contracts from CIA. Do you agree with that? Yes. During the time period that the enhanced interrogation techniques were being used, were they being evaluated? The techniques or yeah, the, 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 the effectiveness of them? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. um, and was, were Drs. Mitchell and Justin involved in that evaluation? The evaluation was based on results. And the results were, and you felt that the results were positive and so that therefore the techniques were good. The results was uh, incredible, uh, very valuable intelligence that mm -hmm. came to us that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And in assessing the results, was there any consideration at all given to the, the physical or psychological harm that was being um, inflicted upon the detainees? We didn't think that any was, uh, was being inflicted. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is, so that was so that was evaluated as part of the no. program. It was not. No. Okay. I was reading through the cables from uh, Abu Zubaydah's interrogation, and time after time they talk about how the result is no new threat information. I can show those to you if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember those cables? Uh, it's been 15 years. Okay, let's, let's show it to you. <laughs> what? Um, so we'll just take, let's start with uh, 1758 because that's also exhibit N to his declaration. Let me, let me, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Look at your declaration, mm -hmm. exhibit N. This is a cable regarding the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it, it goes through a number of, of the application of, I'm sorry, the application the of a number of enhanced interrogation techniques, right? Yes. It describes walling and, um, and it describes the confinement box. And in paragraph nine, um, it says that the subject has not provided any new threat or elaborated on, on any old threat information. Do you see that? Yes. Um, when you read that kind of thing, was there any sense that the enhanced interrogation, that their enhanced interrogation techniques were not being effective? At that point. At that point what? At that point they were not being effective. Mm -hmm. Eventually they were. Okay. In any event, um, so, at any given point, if there was not any new intelligence, that wasn't really the point. The real point was you wanted to look at it overall, right? What do you mean? You wanted to see whether it was successful overall. My uh, objective was to obtain intelligence to protect the homeland, to save American lives, mm -hmm. and this program produced it. And that was my, the way I measured it. Okay. Um, okay. So the way you measured the program was by virtue of whether it provided the intelligence that you were looking for. 
not only provided the intelligence, but allowed us to go and capture other people and, and uh, stop plots and protect the homeland. OK, I understand. Um, OK, just one or two other areas that I'm really just a little bit that I want to go into. I want to talk about the particular plaintiffs in this case. And I want to, and so if you take a look at your report, I'm sorry, your declaration. Let's start with um, paragraph, paragraph, I'm sorry, um, 90. Nine zero. Page 15. <clears throat> and um, The, one of the things it says in paragraph 90 is that under uh, subsection 3, it says, Rahman was declared an enemy combatant. Do you see that? Yes. And you say that that is your understanding. Correct. Correct. Um, where did you get that understanding? He was an, He was declared an enemy combatant. Okay. So, if the judge in this case has held that the defendants have presented no evidence that Gul Rahman was determined to be an enemy combatant prior to his death, is the judge wrong? Objection. Come on, Mr. Lusberg. No, that's a purpose, perfectly appropriate How question. Do we know if the judge is wrong? I'm, a, I'm asking him if. if Why don't we ask the government if they gave us all the documents? We You'll have an opportunity to ask your questions. I don't know. Okay. Your understanding from somewhere was that he was an enemy combatant? Yes. Did you ever see a piece of paper that said that? I don't recall. Okay. Sorry. In, in uh, paragraph 91, it just talks about how Mr. Salim, the plaintiff here, was designated as an enemy combatant. See that? Yes. Um, so we can have. Make one. Uh, 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 let's mark this. 40. Exhibit 40. Let me show you Exhibit 40. <clears throat> ever seen this before? No. Um, so this was not certainly not something that you had seen before you signed the declaration saying that, that uh, Mr. Salim was not an enemy combatant, right? I don't remember these individuals, Suleiman or Saud. Mm -hmm. Suleiman or, or Saud. Saud. S-O-U-D. You don't remember any of them? Okay. I don't. Mm -hmm. And um, when you go through, um, so do you have any personal knowledge as to whether he was or was not an enemy combatant? No. Okay. And is that true with regard to Mr. Rahman and Mr. Sood as well? It's my understanding, but I don't have personal direct 
knowledge. Okay. Um, I see where you say, for example, in paragraph 102, it is my understanding that Dr. Mitchell came in brief contact with Rachman even though he was not classified as an HVD. You see that? Yes. Okay. When you say it's your understanding, that means you don't have personal knowledge of Correct. that, right? Um, and when you say in paragraph 105, it is my understanding that Dr. Mitchell observed Rachman one evening at Cobalt while Dr. Mitchell was traveling as he was uh, with Abd al-Nashiri as he was mm -hmm. rendering, rendered to Black Site Green. That is also not based on your personal knowledge, it's based upon your understanding. Correct. And when you say it's based on your understanding, that's an understanding that you got by speaking to somebody else? By seeing these and seeing some of the, uh, by seeing ex the these ex being exhibits and exhibits here. Okay. What, what exhibit were you looking at in order to, uh, come into, to come to the conclusion that Dr. Mitchell came in brief contact with Rachman even though he was not classified right, as an HPV? I'll, I'll, I'll have to go through it. I don't remember. Okay. But you, you think you saw a piece of paper that yes. said that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and likewise, with regard to this, your understanding that Dr. Mitchell observed Rachman, you got that from some document? Yes. You just don't know. I think, I think it was the uh, Goldman, uh, the Rachman uh, investigation. Okay. You think you learned that from the Rachman I investigation? I think so. Okay. You think you learned that from the what? Rachman investigation. The report, the last. The IG report. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you take a look, just generally look at um, paragraphs, so I don't have to do this with each one, uh, 102, 105 to 108, 110, and 114. Those are all paragraphs that begin is my understanding. In each case, is your understanding based upon the investigation of the Rachman death? 102, 103. 102, 105 through 108. One ten. Yes. And one fourteen. Yes. Those are all based upon the report or other documents that you saw. Correct. Nothing that you have your own personal knowledge of. True. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, just one. Last area. Um, I have read articles, you probably have as well, um, where you're quoted as saying that you want to bring back some form of now illegal interrogation measures like waterboarding, sleep deprivation, and other so-called enhanced interrogation methods approved by the Bush White House. Is that the position that you've taken? Uh, no. So those, what, oh, I'm sorry. What I'm saying is that they need to have something that goes beyond the Army field manual. I, I don't think that some of those enhanced interrogation techniques can ever be brought back. They've already been, you know, given away and there's too much controversy, some other form of techniques that goes beyond the Army Field Manual. Mm -hmm. Have you consulted with um, President Trump or members of his administration with regard to, quote unquote, bringing back torture? No. Well, uh, we never brought, we never used torture, so I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. How about bringing back enhanced interrogation techniques? No. Have you sp spoken with any such people about uh, bringing back black sites? No. Um, have you um, spoken to the, any representatives of the new administration or transition team about resuming a CIA interrogation program? No. Um, have you spoken to anybody about joining the administration? No. Okay. I think that's all I have. But that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think Mr. Smith probably wants to ask some questions. I do. I'm thinking you are. Do. Take a break or should we just well, jump right in? Let's jump into it. Do you, do you want to do it from, you need to get a mic. No, let me try it from here. So, you you well, still I need really, a mic. I really need you close to me, I'm sorry. And I want to be close to you. <laughs> that you will hear me, and if you have any difficulty, then I'll come over. Fair enough? Okay. You, you, you do need a mic, though, Jim. Okay. It's 2.05 p.m. We'll go off the record for technical reasons. Can we, can we just... Oh. Hold on. Thank you.
<laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, good afternoon. Uh, my name again and still is Jim Smith. And as you know, I represent doctors Mitchell and Jessen in this case. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, are you familiar with the plaintiff's theory in this case? Of enhanced interrogation? Yeah, what the plaintiff's theory is in this case. Are you familiar with it? Uh, can you run it by me? Okay. Let me do a little background okay. and then we'll get to it. You mentioned in your testimony with Mr. Lussberg a high value target. Do you remember you used those words? Yes. Okay. Is that synonymous with a high value detainee? Correct. Okay. Can you tell us, uh, for the record, what a high value detainee is? A high value detainee is someone who uh, is believed to have intelligence uh, involving threats to the United States, uh, its people, or its interest overseas. Okay. And are you familiar with the concept of a medium value detainee? Yes. Can you tell us what a medium value detainee is? Someone involved in uh, war against us, uh, but who may not have that level of intelligence uh, that represents an immediate threat to our country. And are you familiar with the concept of a low value detainee? Yes. Can you tell us what a low value detainee is? A lesser combatant, uh, facilitator, uh, person who is not uh, as dangerous as a medium level detainee. Okay. And I take it that high value detainees, medium value detainees, and low value detainees were all considered enemies to the United States of America? Yes. Now, in 2001, when you started working with CTC, did you start using those words, high value detainee, medium value detainee, and low value detainee? I don't recall. Okay. Can you approximate when you started using those terms? When, when you... we captured Abu Zubaydah. Okay. Now, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Was Zubeda, strike that, which one of the three categories did Zubeda fall within? High value. Okay. And why did the government believe that Mr. Zubeda was a high value detainee? Because uh, he had come across our screen uh, in 2000 uh, regarding the Millennium Plots and his dispatching of a terrorist to come into the U.S. through Canada to blow up uh, LAX and California. So the government at the time of his capture believed that there was information that he was directly involved in a plan to blow up the Los Angeles airport? Correct. Okay. Now, did the government also have any beliefs about what relationship, if any, Mr. Zubeda had with Osama bin Laden? Yes. Can you tell us what it is? Well, at one point, we thought he was the chief of operations, uh, but we knew he was a senior uh, al-Qaeda operative. Okay. Now, at the time that Mr. Zubeda was captured by the United States government, what relationship, if any, did the CTC believe that Zubeda had with Osama bin Laden? As far as I can recall, we, we assumed that he had a close relationship with Osama bin Laden. Was he considered Osama bin Laden's first lieutenant, or he, one of them at least? He was considered uh, chief of operations at one point. It was either him or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Okay. But we knew him to be a senior. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. But we knew him to be a senior person in the organization. Okay. Now, when was, when was Zubeda captured? March 2002. Okay. Now, in March of 2002, he was captured and he was taken to... I think what's referred to as a black site, right? Correct. And I'm not asking you to tell me where that black site was. Let's just make that clear, okay? Good. He but <laughs> understood. I just didn't, and that's good. Now, do you know, sir, if that black site was a site for high value detainees? We made it a site for Zubeda. Uh, okay. at first, and then Nashiri second. So it became a site for high-value detainees. Now let's talk about Nashiri for a second. Um, Al Nashiri was who? Nashiri was responsible for blowing up the USS Cole. Okay. USS Cole. Cole. Cole, C-O-L-E. Okay. 
And Nishiri was captured when? Sometime in the fall of 2002. Okay. And he was taken to the same black site where Zubeda was kept? If I recall correctly, yes. Okay. And he was considered a high value detainee? Yes. Okay. Now I want to go back for a second. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time, was there not, when Zubeda was maintained in a black site and being interrogated by FBI agents and CIA agents. Is that correct? Yes. And that was before Dr. Mitchell had any involvement. Is that correct? Uh, no. He had some involvement in that first uh, interrogation. He was there to support and to make recommendations to the team. Okay. Now let me back up for a second. I think at the time that Dr. Mitchell was hired by the CTC, were you essentially the captain of the ship of the Black Sites? I was the captain of the ship of... When, when Abu Zubaydah was captured in March, I was not the director of CTC. Okay. Uh, but I was involved in everything related to CTC, and I had a special interest in making sure that this program got off the ground and, and got off the ground well. Okay. Now, you became the director of CTC when? In May of 2002. Okay. Now, when Dr. Mitchell was originally brought on to the team, if you will, mm -hmm. why was that decision made? This, the decision was made because we had impending threats of all kinds of attacks, anthrax and nuclear and second wave of attacks, and we needed to do something different because we were not getting information through traditional <coughs> interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. As of the time that Dr. Mitchell was brought on, is it fair to say that the traditional forms of interrogation that were being utilized by the FBI and the CIA mm -hmm. were not given, were producing results about what the government was concerned about regarding impending threats? They had produced two results, two pieces of information that were significant, but once he regained his strength, he stopped talking. Okay. And when was that that he stopped talking? Uh, April, May time, time okay. frame, 2002. And are you able to tell us about those two pieces of information? I think so. Uh, we've talked. Do we have a conversation? Absolutely. Step outside. repeat the question, Madam Court Reporter. <laughs> There's like two short questions. I'm going to do both. both sure. Times. And when was that that he stopped talking? Answer April, May time frame 2002. Question, and are you able to tell us those two pieces of information? The two pieces of information that Abu Zubaydah had uh, divulged during the first phase of that uh, interrogation was that he confirmed for us that Mukhtar, and we have seen Mukhtar in, in, in all kinds of different intercepts, was actually Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The second one, and it was very vague information regarding uh, an individual who was supposed to go to the U.S. Uh, to detonate a, a WMD type of device. Okay. WMD. Oh, WMD. Right. Uh, we, he gave us enough where our overseas installations were able to identify the individual as Jose Padilla, and we uh, found where he was, and we tracked him all the way back to uh, Chicago where we alerted the FBI and he was arrested. He actually was, had a plan and had been given $10,000 by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to uh, blow up apartments, residential apartments in different parts of the U.S. using natural gas and have them go off at the same time. Now, you mentioned Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, can you tell us who Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is? Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the chief of operations of al-Qaeda, 
who actually devised the 9-11 plot and okay. sold it to uh, bin Laden. Okay, now let's go back. In the late spring, early summer of 2002, Zubaida is regaining his health, correct? Correct. And he clams up. Correct. And at that time, uh, is that around or about the time that the decision is made to enlist the services of Dr. Mitchell? Dr. Mitchell was already at the site. Okay. Uh, he was providing uh, recommendations and observing what was going on. Okay. But that was about the time that we knew that we had to do something different. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you identified in your direct examination with Mr. Lustberg um, documents that were marked as exhibits J and K to the declaration that you signed that's marked as exhibit 36 in this case. Could I ask you to get out 36? Which one? J. Exhibit 36. Okay. Let's go to item exhibit J within exhibit 36. Exhibit 36? That's the declaration. Oh. So Okay. Are you there, sir? So, yeah, you say. So we're clear. So, paragraph 36 on the declaration? No. no. Exhibit 36 is your declaration. Okay. 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 If you go to exhibit J, okay. within exhibit number 36, okay. you'll come to a document. Okay. Do you recognize this document? It's a document that lists the uh, different uh, techniques. Okay. For the record, um, is it fair to say that Exhibit J, at least in part, represents a memo that was prepared by Dr. Mitchell, dated July 8, 2002? I assume that's correct. Well, if you turn uh, to the... Okay, I believe it's correct. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Well, turn to the third page where you can see, hope this helps Jim Mitchell. Do you see that? Okay. Okay. You've seen this document before today, obviously, right? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize this as the document that was put together by Dr. Mitchell re um, regarding enhanced interrogation techniques? I believe that's right. Okay. Now, were you the person that asked Dr. Mitchell to put this document together, to prepare Yes. It? Okay. And just tell us, so the record's clear, why you wanted him to prepare this document. We were searching for a new way of doing things, and this seemed like the appropriate way to go. Okay. And we needed to have more specific information regarding what were the techniques that he was talking about. Okay. And these are interrogation techniques that are set forth in Exhibit J, right? Correct. Okay. And if you look at the first page of Exhibit J, you'll see that there's a thread of emails. Most of the information is redacted out. Do you see that? Where's that? Go to the first page. See the from and the office and the reference oh, yes. and the like? Mm -hmm. The government's redacted out that information in the production to us. Okay. Okay. Now, do you, you recognize these as the 12 interrogation techniques that you asked Dr. Mitchell to give to the CIA? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then, so we're clear, item number 12 makes reference to the mock burial, right? Yes. Okay. Mock burial. Mock burial. Mock yes. And that interrogation technique was removed. True. Okay. Now, let's go forward for a second. When Dr. Mitchell was hired by the CIA, what specifically was he tasked to do in addition to creating this memo? He was hired in December of 2001 to be a consultant 
uh, to provide advice to do applied psychology. When he, when CTC hired him uh, in July, we had hired him before to go to uh, the uh, black site. But when we decided that we wanted to do this, we hired him to do this and to help us with the implementation of the techniques. OK. The implementation of the techniques on whom? On Abu Zubaydah. OK. <coughs> so is it fair to say? Excuse me. I object to both. Council have used the phrase, is it fair to say? And I don't know what that means. It means different things to different people. So could you rephrase that? I could. Thank you. And if I do it again, it's not intentionally. Just I, an old I, habit yeah. that now that you tell me I should get rid of yeah. it, I'll work hard to do that. Okay. It's I, like I, I, don't I, be, assume. I don't believe it's not <laughs> intentional, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Give it your best shot. All right. Um, the Okay, so the engagement, Dr. Mitchell's engagement started with OTC, was it? Yeah. And then it changed to CTC in the summer of 2002. I believe we gave, we, we paid for uh, his services when he uh, went for, uh, to the uh, first uh, location uh, with the FBI, and that was in April. Okay. Of, of 2002. But by the time he created the memo dated July of 2002, he was working for CTC, C correct? Right? Yes. Okay. And this memo was created solely for the purpose of interrogating Zubeda. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> did there come a point thereafter when Dr. Mitchell, well, let me back up for a second. I think you testified on direct examination that at Dr. Mitchell's request, the CIA also agreed to engage Dr. Jessen. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And when did that happen? July 2002. Okay. Around or about the time of this memo? Yes. And was that solely to assist in the interrogation of Zubeda? Yes. Okay. Now, did there come a time thereafter when Drs. Jessen and Dr. Mitchell started assisting in the interrogation of Abu Zubeda? Yes. Now, I want to go to a statement that you made. You said, if I wrote it down correctly, that Doctors Mitchell and Dr. Jessen were independent contractors. Yes. Remember you said that? Yes. And then you said, if I wrote it down correctly, independent contractors do not make decisions. Do you remember you said that? Yes. Tell us what you mean by that. Independent contractors are subject matter experts. Uh, they give us knowledge that we don't possess. Uh, they would make recommendations, but the ultimate decision makers were the staff people, the, the leadership of the counterterrorism center. Now, who were those decision makers? Objection. Oh, fair point, fair point. I'll withdraw it. Am I permitted to ask the witness if he was the decision maker? Uh, yes, as long as we avoid names and, yeah. uh, and identifying information of other individuals. What about I, titles? Uh, titles at a... At a it depends on the exact title. Let, let me see if I can do it a different way. Can you get out exhibit number 38, please? Number 38? Exhibit number 38, yes. What is, is that? What, what is it or where is it? It's in your pile of information because Mr. Lussberg showed it to you. Can you describe the document? Yes, I can. Um, Mr. Bennett, it is a, it looks like a government cable. It bears Bates numbers, United States, 1170 through 1174. Um, and, well, I'll stop there. Give an extra copy. That one? 
Yeah. We got it. You got it? Okay. Do you have Exhibit 38 before? I have it. Okay. Do you remember that you were asked questions about this um, document in your yes. direct examination? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to just direct your attention to, again, the first page where it says, DCI guidelines for the conduct of interrogation. You see that? Yes, I do. And do you recognize Exhibit 38 as being the guidelines for interrogations? Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> turn, if you would, to the second page of the document. In paragraph mark three, do you see where it says begin text of DCI guidelines? Yes, of DCI guidelines. Okay. I'm going to ask you to jump down two sentences. In the paragraph, do you see where it says, quote, these guidelines address the conduct of interrogations of persons who are detained pursuant to the authority set forth in the memorandum of notification of 17 September 2001. I see You it. see that? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that memorandum? The 17 uh, September 2001 memorandum? memorandum. Yes. Are you familiar with it? I am familiar with it. Are you able to talk about it without violating any um, obligation for classified information? Oh, we need to consult. Depends on okay. the details. Got it. Do you remember the question, Mr. Rodriguez? Yes, you were talking. You were asking about the seventeenth uh, September M O N. Yes. And uh, after discussing it, I'm only authorized to talk about the capture and detain portion of that authority. Okay, can you tell me whatever you're permitted to tell me? I'm telling you, the capture and detain portion of it is that the CIA has the authority to go forth and capture and detain terrorists. Okay. When you say capture and detain terrorists, you mean low value, medium value, and high value, high detainee value terrorists? I don't think they make a determination uh, there. Okay. On, on that when, document. When is the determination made? The determination uh, is made uh, upon capture. Okay. I mean, in many cases, we knew who were we going after, so we already, if we were going after a high value target, we already knew. Okay. But sometimes other people, people were captured in different ways, and at, a, at the time, depending on the knowledge that they had, a determination was made. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you to go back to exhibit number 38 and turn to the third page of the document? I want to focus on the paragraph, the first full paragraph on that page. Do you have it before you? Yes. Now, let's just back up for a second. Did I hear you say earlier today that enhanced interrogation techniques were only to be used on high-value detainees? Yes. Okay. And that was your understanding of the policy and procedures that was in place starting in 2002 and forward. Is correct. that correct? Correct. Okay. In the so to the extent that Dr. Mitchell created that memo that listed those 12 items, it was only contemplated to be used on high-value detainees. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the concept of control. Okay? Go back to this paragraph again, and we're going to read it together. Do you see where it says, quote, enhanced, inter enhanced techniques are techniques that do incorporate physical or psychological pressure beyond standard techniques? Do you see that? Yes. Reading on it says, the use of each specific enhanced technique must be approved by headquarters in advance. Now, let me stop right there. What headquarters is being referenced there? Is that Langley? That's uh, CTC. CTC. Where, C where was CTC located? Uh, uh, CIA headquarters. And where's that? In Langley. Okay. So according to the procedures that were in place, 
no enhanced interrogation could take place unless Langley signed off on it and approved it. Is that correct? Yes. And that was your understanding as the person who was in charge of this program? Yes. Okay. And then it says in addition to being headquarters approval, it must be approved by whom? In some cases, if it was like waterboarding, uh, uh, I believe we had to go to the director to get his approval. The director was who? George Tenet at the time. Okay. So any time, for example, Zabeda was waterboarded, the director had to sign off on it. Is I don't correct? think, he, no, uh, I think the director uh, provided approval to do and ha to do waterboarding. I don't think that he approved it every time, but I'm not sure. I don't think that was the case. Okay. Did you have to approve it? There was it a chain of command. You know, the cable would come to me and I would have to sign off on it myself. So I okay. would be part of the approval process. Okay. Who else was part of the approval process? I don't think I'm allowed okay. to say. Oh, got it, got it. Sorry, sorry. Okay. But there were others within the chain of command at Langley that were part of the approval process? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Now, why did the CI, well, strike that. Why was this process put in place that before there could be any enhanced interrogation techniques, officials at Langley had to sign off on it? Why was that? Well, because this was serious business and we wanted to make sure that uh, it was not done without the approval of the highest levels of the agency. Okay. And what happens if it wasn't approved? Would that mean no enhanced interrogation techniques? No, no enhanced interrogation techniques. Okay. Reading on it says, and may be employed only by approved interrogators for use with a specific detainee. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Why was that part of the process or procedure that was in place? Well, we just wanted to make sure that uh, each detainee uh, had its own approval process. Okay. So with respect to any detainee for which enhanced interrogation techniques would be used, it had to be specifically approved by or for that particular detainee. Cor correct. Okay. And reading on it says with appropriate medical and psychological participation in the process. Do you see that? Where are we again? Yeah, we're in that same, same sentence paragraph. in the same paragraph yes. where it says, mm -hmm. see where it says, with appropriate medical and psychological participation in the process. Yes. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what that means? With the appropriate, I, I don't I don't know what it means. Let me be more precise in my question. Okay. I'll withdraw the one that's pending. Okay. As part of the process that was implemented by the CIA, was it necessary to have a psychologist and a medical doctor in the room while enhanced interrogation techniques were being used on a detainee? Yes. And why was that process put in place? It was put in place to make sure that uh, no harm came to the uh, detainee, and, and if there was a medical emergency, that there would be someone there that could treat it. Okay. Now, I'd like you to turn to the last page of this document. Actually, it starts on the, on the preceding page. I apologize. Do you see where in the second sentence in the paragraph marked four, approvals required, do you see where it says, in all instances, their use shall be documented in cable traffic. Prior, prior approval in writing, paren e.g., by written memorandum or in cable traffic from the director, DCI Counterterrorist Center, with the concurrence of the chief CTC legal group is required for the USF of any enhanced techniques. Let me stop right there. Do you yes. see that? Yes, I do. Was that the procedure that was in place in the years 2002 through 2004? Yes. 
So for example, if a plaintiff in this case contends that they were waterboarded, if procedure was followed, you would expect to see cables authorizing the waterboarding. Is that correct? Yes. And in the absence of the cables, it would suggest to you, would it not, that either there was no waterboarding or it was done in an unauthorized fashion at the site? Yes. Okay. Have you ever seen any cables authorizing any enhanced interrogation techniques on plaintiff sued in this case? No. In your capacity as the director, would you would have had to authorize those enhanced interrogation techniques if, in fact, they were done according to procedure? What year were those captures? 03 and 04. Yes. OK. Did you ever authorize any enhanced interrogation techniques on plaintiff sued? No. Did you ever authorize any enhanced interrogation techniques on plaintiff Salim? No. Did you ever authorize any enhanced interrogation techniques on um, Rockman? No. Have you ever seen any cables as contemplated by the procedure that I'm reviewing here indicating that enhanced interrogation techniques were utilized on any of these three plaintiffs? No. Okay. Now I want to go back for a second. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit more about process, okay? And I want to focus on the period of time where enhanced interrogation techniques were used on Abu Zubaydah. Are you with me? Yes. And if I recall in the record, that's approximately two weeks in August when those enhanced interrogation techniques were used. Does that sound right to you? That's true. Okay. Now I want to talk about process. Mm -hmm. There was this memo that we reviewed that Mr. Mr. Mitchell, or Dr. Mitchell, put together with the 12 and ultimately 11 enhanced interrogation techniques, right? Right. OK. Now, who decided which techniques were going to be used on Zubeda? I think that uh, initially, the way this worked was there was a gradual escalation uh, of techniques Before approval. We, OK, be, but let's just, who ultimately decided whether or not those techniques were going to be used on Zubeda? Um, objection to the degree the question calls for names or identifying information. Fair point. Did Dr. Mitchell decide, or did the United States government decide that enhanced interrogation techniques were going to be used on Zubeda? The US government decided. And so we're clear, to the extent that Zubeda was waterboarded, was it the government who decided when he was going to be waterboarded? Yes. Was it the government who decided how he was going to be waterboarded? Yes. Was it, is it fair to say that everything? Yeah, fair, to, fair to say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is it correct to say that the government decided everything about any of the enhanced interrogation techniques that were used on Abu Zubaydah. Yes. Now I want to go back to several times today. Mm -hmm. My esteemed adversary made reference to the program. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes. And who designed the program. Do you remember that? Right. And I want to make sure that we're all clear about exactly what that means. OK. Isn't it true that the only thing that Drs. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen did was to give the government a memo with 12 suggested enhanced interrogation techniques. Isn't that true? True. And isn't it also true that everything past that, meaning who it was done to, when it was done, how long it was done, was a decision of the United States government? True. And isn't it also true that at every time, every instance, that Dr. Drs. Mitchell and Jessen were involved with Abu Zubaydah, it was at the direction of the United States government. Yes. And isn't it also true that there came a time during that two-week period when they suggested to you and the other decision makers to stop waterboarding? Yes. 
And isn't it also true that you directed them to continue the waterboarding? Yes. And if I recall your testimony, you said that your analysts were concerned that Zubeda was not complying. Yes. Can you tell me what you mean by that? When Abu Zubeda was captured in the safe house where he was captured, in the location where he was captured, we discovered uh, tapes, interrogation, with tapes, not interrogation tape, tapes uh, that he had pre-recorded to celebrate yet another um, major attack on the U.S. And we feared that he had done that in anticipation of an attack that was being planned. And because he had not provided that information uh, during interrogation, we felt that he was not being compliant. And who made the decision to continue the water? Okay. Oh, strike that, strike that, strike that. Are you able to tell me who, in addition to yourself, made the decision to continue the waterboarding? Uh, people who work with me. Okay. Was the director of the CIA involved in that decision? I don't recall. Okay. Now, I want to go back. Mm -hmm. As of August of 2002, the only high-value detainee that was in custody was Zubeda, right? Yes. And then that changed, right? Yes. Al Nasari was captured. Right? Nashiri. Nashiri, yeah, I'm sorry. Al Nashiri was captured. Now, <clears throat> I think you said he was a high value detainee, right? Yes. And then sometime thereafter, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was captured and yes. detained, right? Mm -hmm. Were there any other high value detainees? Yes. Who, before, well, let me just ask, were there any others that Mitchell, and Jessen were involved with? I believe that okay. they were. You can answer the question yes or no, right. I think. Okay. Yes. Okay, hold, hold, hold your thought there. If you can answer the question yes or no, we object to the degree he discusses details. We okay. object to the, we object to the degree he discusses the details. details. Are you able to identify for the record the other high value detainees? Yes. Can you tell me their names? Um, Hold the thought. Objection. One moment. So. Yeah. Um, to clarify, just to redirect to the classification guidance um, indicating which detainee, the detainees that can be discussed, which are the 119. <coughs> they were not all high value detainees. Yes. I can't understand his objection either. The name he has is, he says, publicly known. Hmm. The particular name. I'm sorry, I can't get what you guys are saying. If you want that on the next Let me hear. in part will object. Uh, we've instructed the witness uh, not to discuss um, any involvement of uh, Drs. Mitchell and Jessen with um, particular detainees uh, beyond Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, Al Nashiri, and Gulmar Rockman. Okay. So let's just, can we agree that there were other detainees, high value detainees? Yes. And yes. can we call them Mr. X's? If you want. Is that fair? Okay, yes. just here's the point that I'm trying to understand. The or miss, Mr. or Mrs. <laughs> were there, no, there were, were there no any, were were no there any women? I'm just no. trying to be. Yeah. Like. No, he's not. He's making trouble. He, <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you. We, we went through, Mr. Rodriguez, the process that was used for Zubeda mm -hmm. when enhanced interrogation was, were utilized, right? Correct. And that there were cables. The procedure was followed, correct? Correct. And the government decided when to do it, how long to do it, which days to do it, et cetera, and directed the team. Is that fair? That is fair. Was the same process utilized for the other high-value detainees? Yes. Okay. So we would expect to see for 
uh, Al Nashiri, the same cables and the like, to the extent that he was waterboarded or other uh, enhanced interrogation techniques were used, correct? Yes. Okay. And in all of those instances, Drs. Mitchell and Dr. Jessen acted under the direction of the CIA. Is that correct? That is correct. They exercised no independent judgment. They did what they were told. That is correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is it <clears throat> correct to say that Dr. Jessen and Dr. Mitchell only supported the CIA with respect to high-value detainees? That was their uh, contract. That's what they were supposed to do, was to support uh, the CTC uh, with high-value detainees. Okay. And is that, in fact, what they did? Yes, except there is uh, some evidence that apparently en route to another black site, they were asked to uh, look at a detainee. And this was, is Rockman? That's right. Rockman. Okay. This is Rockman. Okay. And I'm going to come back to Rockman in a minute. Right. Let me just get a little background in case the jury watches this tape. Mm -hmm. I think Site Green was where Zubeda and the other high value detainees was kept. Is that right? Correct. Okay. There were other what we call black sites, right? Right. And were they for medium and low value detainees? No. Who were they for? High value detainees. High value detainees. So if you go back to exhibit number 38. Is this? Yes. Do you remember Mr. Lustberg asked you why this memo was sent to Cobalt? Yes. OK. And for the record, so that everybody understands, Cobalt was a name for one of the black sites, right? Yes. And is it, fair to, is it correct to say that the reason why these procedures were sent to Cobalt is because there were high-value detainees at Cobalt? I guess. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. OK. I'm surprised by it. OK. All right. <coughs> now, let me. Let me go back to, you said that doctors Mitchell and Jessen designed the program. Remember? Yes. And then I think you even said that they were the architects of the program. Yes. OK. And I want to make sure that the record's crystal clear on that. What you really meant by that was they prepared a memo with 12 enhanced interrogation techniques. Right? Yes. That was, to the, that was the extent of their architect, if you will. Yes. And after that, every decision about when and how to use those techniques was a decision that was made by the United States government. Isn't that right? That's right. OK. Now, were enhanced interrogation techniques that are a part of that memo intended to be used on low-value detainees? No. Were they intended to be used on medium-value no. detainees? Are you aware in your capacity as the director of CTC during the period of time 2002 through 2004 when you ever authorized enhanced interrogation techniques as they're contemplated by that Mitchell memo to be used on a low or medium-value detainee? No. And if that would have been done, is it your testimony that that was directly against your orders? Yes. Okay. Not just my orders, but the, the whole regulation, the whole guidance, everything that we had. Now, do you remember I asked you about the plaintiff's theory of the case? Yes. Are you aware that the plaintiffs contend that the program that was designed by Drs. Mitchell and Jessen was used on all of the detainees. The philosophy? Let's go back. OK. Distilled to its essence, the plan that was, a, that was designed by Drs. Mitchell and Jessen 
was that two-page memo with 12 enhanced interrogation techniques, right? Correct. Could you tell me the basis for that objection? I want to cure it. The question is completely was compounded. Was compounded and confusing? Okay. I'll keep the question and the answer then. <laughs> and so we're clear, that plan, that two-page memo, was never intended to be used on anyone other than high-value detainees. That is correct. Okay. Now, I want to ask you about these three plaintiffs. Do you have that document? I think I have a document that you authored, and we're going to find out in a second. What's the next exhibit number? 41. Are we, are we sequentially marking them again? 41. For the record, Doc, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, we have marked as exhibit number 41 a document produced by the United States government. Thank it you. bears Bates label 001542 through 1544. Take a moment and look at this document. Most of it's redacted. And then tell me when you're ready to go. OK, let me read it. OK. Okay. Have you read the document, sir? Yes. Do you recognize this document? No. Okay. If you turn to the third page of the document, do you see where it says, Sincerely, Jose A. Rodriguez, Jr., yes. Director, DCI Counterterrorist Center? Yes. Okay. That's you, isn't it? Yes. But you know how many of these I signed? Uh, that's why I couldn't remember. Okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not being critical of you. No, I'm, I'm just, just telling you. if I can refresh your recollection. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's go back for a second. Yeah. Do you Tell want me. A, do you want a Xanax or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he's a getting lot. all worked up about yeah. it, is it fair yeah. to say? Yeah. Lawyers yeah. have been saying it for 100 years. Of okay. pills here. All right. Mr. Benner, are you okay? <coughs> as well as usual. All right. <laughs> Sir, can, tell me what this document is. The fact that we are turning over an individual to the military. To me, it means that the value is not one of a high-value detainee. Right. That is someone that uh, we don't need in our possession that we needed to turn over uh, to the military. So, in effect, this document is, if you will, a 
transition memo about a subject that's being turned over from custody by the CIA to the military, Correct. the U.S. military? Yes. And are you aware of the name S-U-L-E-I-M-A-N Abdullah? Do you know who that is? No. Do now I do. I mean, now I, I know, but I... Okay. Do you know him to be a plaintiff in this case? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to ask you, um, you prepared this document? <coughs> no. Someone under your direction prepared it? Yes. Okay. And it was necessary to prepare a document like this in order to transfer custody of a subject from the CIA control to the military control, Yes. right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you see where it says in the document, quote, we request that the military service in Bagram take immediate custody and control of these individuals according to ICRC appropriate access to them and hold them in an appropriate detention facility until the U.S. government determines otherwise, period. We believe this transfer of detainees to DOD control will assist the USG in addressing some of the concerns raised by the ICRC while ensuring these individuals are removed from the battlefield. You see that? Yes. Do you have a memory of what the concerns were by the ICRC as they applied to Mr. Salim? I do not have a memory uh, regarding as they applied to Mr. Salim. I remember in general that they wanted access to detainees. Okay. And do you know why access was wanted? They wanted to do what they do, which is check on them and make sure that they're okay. Do you know why Salim was taken into custody by the CIA? I assume he was, well, he was picked up somewhere. Okay. Let's take, take a look at the second page, if you will. Do you see where it says, Salim Abdullah is a Tanzanian national suspected of involvement in Al-Qaeda's East Africa cell, specifically as a, paren page three, facilitator of the Al-Qaeda's 1998 attacks against the U.S. embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salim, Tan Tanzania. Tanzania. Let me stop right there. Was that true? Yes. Okay. And reading on, it says, Abdullah first came to Kenya in 1993 and stayed in Mombasa with East African embassy bombing fugitive Fahid Mohammed Ali, I'll spell it, M-S-A-L-A-M, with whom he later trained in Afghanistan. You see that? Yes. Was that true, too? I assume so. Don't assume, please. Well, maybe. Don't know. Okay. Was uh, let me see if I can cut to the quick mm -hmm. here, sir. Was Salim held in custody by the CIA because he was believed to be a part of terrorist activity? Yes. Okay. Take a look at the footnote. Well, it may not be a footnote actually. There's a space, and then there's information on the bottom of the page. Do you see that? I see it. Do you see where it says, legal basis for detention? The law of armed conflict is a sufficient, but not the sole legal basis for detention of the subjects. Under that theory, parties to the hostilities have the right to target enemy combatants <coughs> engaged active hostilities, including the right to capture and detain. Do you see that? Yes. Is that why Salim was detained by the CIA because he was considered an enemy combatant? Yes. Okay. Reading on, it says, this is especially true where such detention is necessary to prevent an individual from further engaging in hostilities. Do you see that? Yes. Was that a concern of the United States government that yes. led to his continued detention? Yes. Reading on, it says, a combatant can also be an individual affiliated with an organization engaged in hostilities or one actively support or facilitating such attacks. Each of these individuals is linked to Al-Qaeda members and known terrorists or was captured engaging in active attacks against coalition forces. Do you see that? Yes. Is that why Salim was detained? Yes. Okay. Is there any doubt in your mind that you, the CIA considered him an enemy combatant? No. Okay. 
Let's move on then to Rockman. We're going to mark the next exhibit as exhibit 41. Could I just have a second? I'm oh, sorry? have exhibit number 42 before you, sir? I do. For the record, let me identify it as a document produced by the United States government. It bears Bates label 001061 through 63. Have you seen this document before today, sir? I do not know. Okay. Let me just direct your attention to the subject. Do you see where it says, eyes only, Ghoul Rockman, chronology of events? You see that? Yes, I do. And this document was obviously created by the United States government. Would you agree with that? Yes. And because of the redactions that have been made by the United States government, it's difficult to tell who created the document. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Would you agree with me that the document was created by the CIA? It appears to be have been created by the CIA. I have no way of knowing. Okay. Now, do you see where it says, sir, in paragraph two, the following chronology of events relating to the death of enemy combatant Ghoul Rockman? And let me stop right there. Do you see that? Yes. Does that in any way refresh your recollection whether or not Ghoul Rockman was considered by the CIA <coughs> at the time that he was taken into custody to be an enemy combatant? He was an enemy combatant. Okay. And can you tell us why the CIA believed that Ghoul Rockman was an enemy combatant? He was captured in battle. Can you, so, so that if a jury watches this tape, tell us what you know about how he was captured and why he was taken into custody. Uh, I do not remember the specifics, but I do re know that he was captured in battle. Okay. Who was he battling with? He was battling the U.S. government. Okay, so he was not supporting the United States flag, is that correct? No. In fact, he was against it, right? He was. And was he part of another al-Qaeda cell? Yeah, he was the uh, part of the, uh, I forget the, the name of the cell itself, but it's, it was supportive of al-Qaeda. Okay. And do you know or have any knowledge of whether or not while Rockman was in custody with the CIA, he threatened to kill every CIA officer in that facility if and when he got out? Do I know why? Do you know if he did that? Yes. Okay. And the circumstances of his death, are you familiar with them? Yes. Okay. Now let me back up for a second. Was Ghoul Rockman considered a high-value detainee? No. Okay. So is it fair to say that he should not have been subjected to any enhanced interrogation techniques? Yes. That is fair to say? Yes. Okay. Now, you said earlier today, if I heard you correctly, that you have some knowledge about doctors Mitchell and Jessen having some contact with Ghoul Rockman. Yes. Did I hear you correctly? Yes. Okay. Let's start with Dr. Mitchell. Are you aware, well, let me back up for a second. Ghoul Rockman was in custody for approximately two weeks. Is that right? I do not know. Okay. Um, do you remember if he was in custody for a relatively short period of time? Yes. Okay. And he died in his cell. Is that correct? Yes. Now, that was at Cobalt? Is that where he was kept or detained? Yes. Okay. Now... 
do you, were you familiar with who the guards were, the night guards, who maintained control over the Cobalt facility? Objection. Um, or, give us a moment. It's all yes. Can we have a moment to discuss with uh, the witness? You got it. Anytime you need it, just say. Thanks. Three minutes.